it's myself, Audrey Momonai, Rick Campo, Rolando Martinez, Paula Mendoza, and as I understand it, Mr. Ravon will be joining us live, live via Zoom. Is he on now? Okay, great. <clears throat> um, if there are any elected officials, and I see Placido Gomez is here. Hi, good to see you. Um, are any other elected officials here, please stand and be recognized, or Placido, please feel free to stand and be recognized. Thank you. Thank you for being with us. Okay. Um, <clears throat> We are um, going to do the pledge um, because we do not have a pledge leader this evening. So I guess the full board just stand up and we'll do the pledge. Okay. And everybody else, come on with us. Okay. Where are we going? Okay. Ready? Go. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, Liberty and justice for all. Honor, Honor the, the Texas, Texas flag. flag. I, I pledge allegiance, allegiance to thee, Texas, Texas one, one state, state, under God, God one and indivisible. indivisible. Thank you. <clears throat> um, i next like to turn it over to uh, Vice President uh, Rick Campo to read our proclamation re recognizing Arab American Heritage Month. Yes, thank you. Um, uh, I'm, I'm going to read the, uh, uh, this proclamation that we're going to adopt tonight, which is, uh, whereas um, Arab Americans make valuable contributions to vital, vi virtually every aspect of American society, and whereas since immigrating to America, men and women of Arab, Arab descent have shared their vibrant heritage while also setting excellent examples of model citizens and public servants, and whereas they brought with them their resilient family values, strong work ethics, and a commitment to the community that have strengthened our nation. And whereas they join all Americans in the desire to see a peaceful and diverse society in which individuals are treated equally. Now therefore, the school board and the superintendent of schools of the Houston Independent School District do hereby proclaim April, 20, April 2024, Arab American Heritage Month in HISD, and encourage all to join in this, uh, join in this uh, to observe this and to celebrate the rich traditions of the Arab American culture. In witness thereof on the 11th day of April 2024. Thank you, Mr. Kempo. Next, I would like to ask board member Michelle Cruz Arnold to read our proclamation recognizing volunteers in public schools recognition week. Ms. Cruz Arnold. Whereas every year thousands of parents, businesses, and community members support students and teachers in the Houston Independent School District by donating their time, resources, and knowledge, and whereas these contributors serve in a variety of roles including mentoring, tutoring, and assisting in classrooms, and whereas a robust and successful education system requires community engagement, and volunteers selflessly illustrate the power of that partnership, and whereas National Public School Volunteer Week is observed during the third full week of April, now therefore we, the Houston Independent School District School Board and Superintendent of Schools, proclaim April 22nd through 26, 2024, Volunteers in Public Schools Recognition Week in HISD, and encourage all to express appreciation for the dedicated supporters who assist and enrich the lives of our students and teachers. In witness thereof on this 11th day of April, 2024. Thank you. Um, before we proceed with hearing from the speakers uh, tonight, I want to note that without objection from my colleagues, I am pulling item 19, review of the board's quarterly self-evaluations from the consent agenda for discussion and vote later this evening. We will now hear from speakers who registered to address the board. Due to the large number of speakers this evening, we will exercise meeting management provision under board policy BED local to hold the hearing of the community after 7 p.m. tonight. We will hold the hearing of the community after board business has been conducted. Hearing of the community speakers were contacted about this change via email earlier today. We will hear from agenda speakers at this time in the order in which they signed in this evening. Please identify yourself and your topic when you step up to the microphone. We will prioritize public officials and students. Please note that Spanish live captioning is available for those viewing the meeting via live stream and live Spanish interpretation is available in person in the auditorium. 
Public comment during school board meetings will only be available to those persons who have signed up to speak <clears throat> prior to the meeting time per current protocol. Verbal and other disruptions by persons during the school board meetings are not acceptable as they inhibit the board's ability to conduct business and the public's ability to observe those processes. Persons who participate in such behavior will be given one warning and if the behavior is repeated, they will be asked to leave the meeting. We have 190 registered speakers who will be limited to one minute each per board policy as we have more than 30 people signed up to speak to address the board tonight. We ask that you please stay on topic and refrain from naming individuals, especially students, as our identity is protected under the law, but you may name your own child. <clears throat> I ask that you please respect our procedures and the other speakers and end your comments promptly when your time has expired and the timer rings. Um, this is a reminder to all the speakers this evening. If you will please state your name before beginning your remarks, that would be appreciated. We will start with public officials. Um, the first public official that I see here is Placido Gomez. So, sir, if you'll come up. And please go ahead when you're ready. Thank you so much. Um, I'm here to talk about the first item of the agenda, community engagements. And I strongly urge you, whatever the plan is for community engagement, to involve the elected board. Uh, I've told everybody who would listen, both publicly and privately, that you know, I know that you are all very open to feedback and willing to listen. Uh, but also, to no fault of your own, uh, I'm in a much better position to gain trust in the community given my status as an elected board member. Um, so I look forward to hearing the plan. I urge you to make sure you involve me and other elected board members in it. I also want to note that last week I had the honor of going to visit some high, uh, a high school, uh, North Forest High School, and some of the feeder schools. And I don't have enough time to go into all the detail, uh, but I will say that the teachers, students, maintenance staff, administrators there have a lot to be proud of. And I have no doubt in saying that I would have been much better off had I been a student at North Forest High School compared to where I went to school. I might have even been smart enough to stay out of school board politics and not run for school board. Um, Though it's too late for me, though, uh, I believe that the North Fork. Thank you. Um, is Ms. Hernandez on the Zoom? No? And I don't see that any other elected officials have come in yet. Okay, we will now hear from speakers who identify themselves as students when they checked in this evening. Um, we know that two students are on Zoom. So our first student. Is uh, Phoenix Leonard, and I think that folks are in order. Do we have who who has the number? One? Oh, is that you, sweetie? Okay, great. second grader at war and, and I'm grateful for the opportunity to learn a second language. I enjoy learning Spanish and talking with my friends in Spanish. I love surprising people with the fact that I can speak Spanish. Being at school where so many of the students and teachers speak Spanish has helped me to learn so much helped me to learn it so much faster. I hope my little cousin has the opportunity to learn Spanish at Wharton when she is old enough to. Please vote to keep all of war in a dual language Spanish immersion program. Gracias por preocuparse por mi escuela y por mi educación. Thank you for caring about my school and about my education. Thank you. <clears throat> Emily, I don't see that there are any other students who have arrived who have numbers. Is that correct? I see Luca Candida. Luca Candida? I see number four. Um, number ten. Okay, Mr. Candida. Thank you. Of course. 
Okay. Go ahead. Hola, mi nombre es Luca Candida. Comparto las palabras de mi, mi amigo Lucky Morgan. Él es un poco timido. <laughs> Hello, my name is Luca Candida. I will share uh, some words from my friend Lucky Morgan because he's a little shy. Estoy en cuarto grado en Warden. Vivo a cuatro cuadras de la escuela. Mi mejor amigo viva ve al otro lado de la calle y caminamos juntos a la escuela. I'm in fourth grade at Warden and I live four blocks from my school. My best friend lives across the street and we walk together to school. Tengo dislexia. Eso significa que aprendo a leer de manera diferente. También tengo ADHD, lo que significa que me resulta difícil prestar atención. I'm dyslexic. That means that I learn in a different way. Also, I have ADHD what it means that it's very difficult for me to pay attention. Me encantan los profesores de Warden. Me cuidan como familia. Aprobé el examen de GT este año. I love my teachers at Warden. They take care of me as family, and I pass all my tests, the GT, this year. Me encanta aprender en español. Yo también quiero aprender francés. Por favor, no acepte el inglés solo en Warden. Por favor, mantengan a Warden como una escuela de barrio. Gracias. Thank you. Our next uh, student. Please, make Wharton only, not only English school. Please, keep Wharton like the school from the neighborhood. Thank you. <laughs> our, next, our next student speaker is Nova Uribe. Hi, my name is Nova, and I practically grew up in the school library. April is school library month, so let's celebrate by not removing certified librarians from HIC schools. Mike Miles' new compensation plan does not include librarians at all, and they will instead be kept as teachers at the principal's discretion in non-NES schools. He has already removed librarians from NES schools, even though librarians are a crucial part of students' learning. Librarians teach critical thinking and help students grow up with a lifelong love of reading and learning. I go to MPVA, and my librarian is an essential part of my school environment. She does so much more than just checking out books, like helping us find reliable digital resources. My mom is a certified teacher librarian. In fact, she has five, five valid TEA certifications. Mike Miles, on the other hand, has zero. Without librarians, I would not be the person I am today. Board members, some of you have children. Some are even HIC parents. Would you want your children to go to a school without access to books? Libraries are amazing places where kids can go to expand their knowledge and to read if they don't have books at home. And you're taking that away. Don't remove libraries or librarians. Remove Mike Miles. Okay. Our next, and I see a couple of um, folks have joined us. I'm going to. Um, We've got one more student speaker, so I'm just going to let them speak, and then we'll get to the elected officials, Mr. Moore and Mr. Johnson. Thank you for being with us tonight. Um, our next speaker is Ashlyn Morton. Hello. My name is Ashlyn Morton. Mike Miles once said, and I quote, was the plant killed or did it simply not have what it takes to survive in a fast-paced environment? The issue with this is you're not talking about plants. You're referring to people. No, not people, children. The students of the school district you are responsible for, except we're not struggling to survive from a fast-paced environment. We are being murdered by our unelected board's sheer incompetence to do their job. You may be able to threaten principals and fire teachers, but as there, there is nothing you can do about the youth. Tanya Fajan once said, when the system is not made for us, we will burn it down. The youth want a democratic system because this district is no longer here to support us. 
So here's a quote for not only you, Mike Miles, but to Ted Cruz, Greg Abbott, and the TEA. The youth will burn it down until it is made for us. I think the, the next two student speakers are on Zoom. Um, Mr. Johnson, I believe you wanted to make a statement. I'm sorry? Um, what numbers do they have? Okay, my thing's not updating. Let's let's have the let the kids go. Good. Okay, that's great. Number eight. Okay. Mr. Miles, my name is Olivia. I am seven years old, and I am a bilingual student. I am here for my teachers who are too afraid to speak, but not me. I want to ask that you do not fire our librarians and instead give them all the support they need to help us succeed. If you fire our librarian, how will we be able to enjoy the books that she looks after? How will we the name that book club? which has helped me to discover new exciting books and has helped me to make new friends that also love to read. So I suggest that you leave our librarians and our books alone. I'm sorry, sir, but you picked the wrong city to mess with. This is Houston. Thank you. Okay. Our next uh, student speaker is Cheyenne Afghani. Is she here? No? Uh, Isabel Bunn? Is she here? Oh, okay. Are you Cheyenne? Uh, Afghani? Come on. Yes, sir, please go ahead. Hello, um, I'm Cheyenne Afghani, and I am representing Kickstart Kids, and I want to talk about self control today. So um, self-control is a thing that everybody desires. It allows us to like focus on things without getting distracted. That's something like that Kickstart has really taught me over time I've been in the program. I'd always tell myself that I would do something only to never do it. I would then get angry at myself, leading myself into a path of distress. When I came to the, to the karate program at my school, I realized I truly admired the martial arts. Uh, it gave me a path, and even greater, a goal to work towards. I always strive to be the best, and I would go home and practice for like hours every day. Once this happened, I eventually realized that I had created a goal for myself, and I like controlled myself, and I stayed focused, and I became more happy like with who I am. And over time in the program, I really think I have grown as a person. And I, I came into middle school like a little ratty kid, and now I'm in eighth grade, about to go to high school. <laughs> I'm ready. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, the next um, student speaker is Alara Rahman. Excuse me, Isabel Bunn. Are you? Come on up. Hello, my name is Alara, and I'm in sixth grade. If HISD takes away libraries and turns them into detention zones, students' reading activity would decrease. According to Pew Research Center, 87% of students visited the library to borrow books. When reading, students feel pleasure, which is connected to higher scores, a wider vocabulary range, and solid mental health. HISD also created a rule saying that if a student is a poor reader, then teachers can't call on them to read aloud. How are these students supposed to get better when there are no libraries for practicing? Additionally, when libraries become detention zones, students associate stress with libraries, which is harmful for their growth. Let li oh. In conclusion, by HISD taking away an important piece of learning and replacing it with detention, HISD is harming the students' future. Not a few, thousands. Let libraries read. Thank you. Thank you. Our next student speaker is Isabel Bunn. Is she here? Okay, our next uh, student speaker is Samuel Salazar.
Ladies and gentlemen of the board, my name is Samuel Salazar, and I'm an eighth grade student and member of the Frank Black Middle School Kickstart Kids Karate Program. For the past three years, the Kickstart Program has not only taught me karate, but many important values. Today, I'd like to highlight the value of respect. Respect is associated with the words esteem, consideration, admiration, and the regards for others, especially oneself. This core value is deeply integrated in the karate curriculum and is a fundamental aspect of the program. We learn the importance of respecting authority the moment that we enter the dojo with a bow, as well as how we address and interact our instructors and fellow students. students. The lesson of respect from the program is carried by its students in school and beyond as a martial artist, a dedicated scholar, and a respectful citizen. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next student speaker is George Stansel. Is George here? Go ahead. Hello, I'm George and I'm in fifth grade. I've come to talk about the importance of library services and Name That Book. Name That Book got me excited about reading. I've been doing it since I've been in second grade. Name That Book teaches kids teamwork and gets them excited about reading. Name That Book also teaches kids responsibility because they have to be a team player and be responsible with reading their books. It's made me a better and more engaged student. In conclusion, I urge you to bring back library services and keep important programs like Name That Book and HISD because it gets kids more engaged and excited about reading and teaches responsibility, teamwork, and important reading skills. Thank you. Thank you. Our next, our next student speaker is Ella Taylor. Is Ella Taylor here? No? Okay. Um, Christiana Thomas. Is Christiana here? <clears throat> Go ahead. I want to start off by doing something that you likely aren't familiar with. I want to thank you and acknowledge success in deciding to reinstate stipends for speech and debate coaches. Though this is still not enough and it still requires continued attention. I know a 25% reduction seems small, but it incentivizes teachers and add more students and go to more tournaments. And it's only for the best of the best, so it won't deeply impact the budget. Debate has been a pivotal part of my life. It teaches me how to speak, how to read papers, and make connections. I know the board is reviewing SAT and ACT scores. I know you want to raise these scores, and I know how. According to a study in the LA Times, debate raises students' GPA by 0.4 points, their reading scores by 25%, and their chances of graduation by 70%. The former Secretary of Education called debate the great equalizer, which cannot be the case if we neglect it and force PTOs to pick up the slack, since it means that only wealthy areas will have it. A 25% reduction may seem small, but it's the difference between more inequality and education forces more students Thank you. Our next student speaker is Alejandra Ubiera. Go ahead. Hi, I'm Alejandra and I'm in the fifth grade. Please reconsider the way you evaluate teachers. One time when my teacher was teaching, me and my classmates were astonished when a stranger entered our classroom and interrupted our teacher to order him to cut the magnetic borders around the material on the bulletin board. Is a magnetic strip more important than our learning? Not only was this embarrassing to my teacher, it was disrespectful. We deserve better. Please change the system to be more fair and respectful to me and my teachers. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is en en Enrique. My name is Enrique and I am in the fifth grade. Please fire Superintendent Miles. Not one decision he has made has been good. He is too focused on test scores, but he has never done anything effective about them. You can't magically learn by taking the same tests, by taking tests over and over again. 
We need to actually do something about the problem. Maybe one reason for the failure is the low budget for most schools. Giving them 12% less would really do something, something bad. We should give them more money and, fo and not focus too much on tests. Thank you. Thank you. I think we've got uh, two student speakers via Zoom, Emily. Is that right? What's the child's name? Uh, we added August Pichot. We, have, we did okay. have it as a student. Excuse August Pichot? Oh, come on up. I am a fifth grader, and I think libraries are very important. I was sad to learn that the central office library positions were cut. My school has a wonderful library, and I hope we can keep her. I, as a dyslexic, librarians help me to find books like graphic novels to encourage me to read. Many kids don't have access to libraries outside of their schools. They need books to grow their reading strengths. If I didn't have a library at my school, I don't think I would want to read as much. Since graphic, since novels, books can be a challenge for me. Libraries have a variety and help kids find their interests. Please keep libraries at school. Libraries help everyone, not just the people who like to read. Thank you. Uh, young man, are you, is he a speaker? Okay, August. Oh, great, come on up. Don't have access to libraries outside of their schools. They need books to love their reading. Okay. I don't have a library. I don't think I would want to. Okay. August, what's your last name? Um, Pisha. Oh, okay, great. All right, go ahead. I'm concerned about losing people in the library service department and the impact that might have on Name That Book. Name That Book has helped me become a better teammate. We learn to listen to each other's ideas and work with people we don't usually work with. I've also read books that I normally would not pick up off the shelf. For example, I have read books where the characters have lots of different perspectives, like The Last Beekeeper, Black Boy Joy, and Invisible. Another thing is that I have ADHD, so it's harder to finish a book all the way. But with Name That Book, I read multiple books from front to back. So if you remove the library service people, then there will be lots of students across Houston who will miss out on the experience, experience of Name That Book. You say you want to prioritize literacy, so don't remove the library service. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you. Are there any other student speakers? Okay, what is your name? Olivia Lowe. Olivia Lowe, okay. Come on up. Hi, my name is Olivia Lowe, and I'm a student representative of Kickstart Kids Karate and HISD. I'm here to tell you about how karate has affected my life at school through discipline. Discipline is defined as the practice of training people to obey rules or a code of behavior. Karate has taught me to be disciplined not only in class, but in everyday life. After being in the Kickstart program, I started to be more organized, I was procrastinating less, getting better grades, and was generally more happy. In the Kickstart Kids Values curriculum, it says, I discipline myself to achieve my goals. I found this to be true, not just in my life, but also in my peers. This inspires responsibility and sets up a successful path for students to make wise choices for the future. And I think that we should continue it. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Come on up, and if you can just tell us your name, please. My name is Bryn Cabe. Okay, go Thank ahead. You. Mr. Miles, we spoke last meeting. Well, I spoke and you glared at me, and I was struck by the fact that with so many of us coming up here and speaking to you month after month at these meetings, you haven't had that moment of self-reflection that makes a person stop and think, perhaps I've got it all wrong. Perhaps I shouldn't treat my schools like prisons and remove arts education, certified librarians, and libraries. Perhaps instead of tearing down my district with random spot checks and a culture of fear, I should advocate for it. I should listen to the principals in my schools and really try to understand what, make, what makes each school so unique and each of their needs important. I should encourage the pockets of excellence and not try to force standardization just because. Mr. Miles and the board, as a 12-year-old who dealt with the interruptions of COVID-19, Hurricane Harvey, and countless other threats to the stability of my school home, I need you not to be another problem. We need you to be part of the solution. We need your help, not your judgment. I challenged you to be a better human last time we spoke, and I will challenge you again. Be a better human. This time, do better. 
are there? Let's see, maybe one, one other student speaker. Come on up and please identify yourself, please. Um, my, uh, my name's uh, Ella Taylor. This week is National Libraries Week, so I want to talk about the importance of libraries. I could tell you about how they helped me my entire childhood, gave me a place to go, and people who understood me, let me learn everything I wanted to learn, and gave me name that book, which encouraged me and other kids in my school to read a minimum of 25 novels every year. Thanks, Ms. Cooper. But I don't think that's really what our, student, our superintendent cares about, and I've already said it before. So. I'll talk about statistics and test scores. Librarians are proven to improve reading scores. According to the School Library Journal, states that gained librarians between 2005 and 2009 had significantly higher increases in the fourth grade NAEP reading scores than schools who lost them. This shows that, NAEP, that the NAEP, one of the tests you use to justify your takeover, is negatively affected by the lack of librarians. Your so if your sole purpose is to increase test scores, why are you doing things that actively sabotage that mission? Studies show that librarians help the students who are hired to improve test scores. Thank you. Okay, are there any other student speakers who have arrived? Okay, very good. Other than, we'll get to the Zoom folks, yeah. Okay, let's switch to Zoom and then we'll go to our elected officials. Thank you for your grace letting the kids talk. Suhani, go ahead. On behalf of a teacher who has stood up for students' needs, I have one year experience and I begged for help. Please give me advice, help me earn my stripes. I want to do what's right, but I don't have the time. The district resources are easy. The pre-AP could find it breezy. We finished a semester in a week. The content was weak, but in addition to geography, I'm teaching US history because the school refuses to hire someone new. I'm scared of removal, so I agree to double up and move rooms. My U.S. history students need attention. We need translation. Having over eight native languages, you don't account for this. They send cookie cutter lessons for someone else's kids. I get written up for modifications, building relations, asking questions, decorations. Finally, when I am at my ropes and I get removed for teaching at my students' chess on the last day before winter's rest, no trust, no bond. Thank you. at Conta Elementary School. I am speaking on item 14. Accelerated learning is what happens when you fail the STAR test. Yes, you spend many more hours studying and stressing to pass STAR. If you fail more than one STAR test, you, then you have to do even more drill and kill and test prep. People say that you can't opt out of STAR, but I did. My parents helped me, so you can too. Since opting out was a score of zero, I technically failed STAR. Then my parents opted me out of accelerated learning, too. STAR is not required for students in grades 3 through 8 to move on to the next grade level. If your report card grades and attendance are good, you should pass to the next grade. No one really likes STAR. No one likes it because of STAR. AGISE lost their elected school board and got an uncertified superintendent instead. For more information about opting out, visit optouttaxis.net. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, um, well, uh, again, thank you to those um, <clears throat> representatives of our community who are here with us tonight. Uh, Mr. Johnson, would you like to speak? Sure. <clears throat> Good evening. I had prepared statements, but after listening to these children, I think HISD is doing wonderful. And instead of changing the entire system, we should probably emulate whatever's going on at those schools. Those children have been amazing. To, to Superintendent Miles of the board, let me thank you guys uh, for allowing me to speak just for a few seconds. Uh, whenever I get questions that I can't answer, and I've gotten hundreds of calls and letters from uh, teachers and staff of schools that are asking simple questions that I cannot answer, and so I'm here again just to simply ask the question. 
what exactly is the plan for HISD. We cannot operate from a vacuum and just simply make plans and tell the district, you're going to like it, don't worry about it. Our teachers need predictability, our parents need predictability, and our students need predictability. And so I implore you guys to do better. This is a democracy. We cannot simply, although you were, although you were appointed, does not mean you're not responsible to the citizens of this great city and this great district. I'm asking that you have more empathy, certainly have more understanding, and give more information so that our children, our teachers, and our parents understand what is going on uh, in this district. How do you go out and get a bond when you've lost the, 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 the confidence of the community? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Council Member Castillo, did you want to say a few words? Thank you for being with us tonight. Good evening, Board and Superintendent. My name is Mario Castillo, Houston City Council Member, District H. And I'm here tonight to ensure that the voices of my constituents are heard specifically with respect to Crockett Elementary, uh, its potential transition into the NES program, and the status of its magnet program. Um, this is a school that has a very highly regarded arts magnet program that adds so much enrichment to children's education. Uh, it's currently committed to being funded for another year, uh, which is very concerning. The constituents have reached out to me with a number of concerns. They are legitimate. I want to ensure that they are listened to and respected. Uh, the library is being shut down at the end of this year. This is a Title I school, 71% Latino, and it serves a great community. But that program, that magnet program, my ask tonight is that it's committed to Thank you. And board member Savant Moore, did you have a, want to speak? We all know that we need a bond. If we don't get a bond, the most affected community will be my district number two. So I'm asking that the board of managers enact the historical black school protection plan. Make sure that Booker T, Washington, Kashmir, Wheatley, North Forest, Worthing, Madison, North Forest, all these schools are put on a no closure list, no consolidation list for a minimum of at least five years. We are willing to work with you, Mr. Miles. Every Monday I play golf. I, I would love to taste your eggs You that you talked about at the district meeting. The bond won't pass if you won't collaborate with the community. I want to thank everyone that came out on Saturday at that funeral for Trustee Kathy Bluford. Please continue to keep her in your prayers. Keep the, um, her entire family in her prayers. Thank you for the HISD people that came out. In 2035, I'm going to be 50 years old. So I just turned 39, and I had a... Thank you. Okay. All right, thank you very much um, for being here. Next, we will call agenda speakers to the microphone in groups, unless there's any other elected officials that I missed. Oh, okay, very good, thank you. Um, 
We're going to call agenda speakers to the microphone in groups, beginning with speaker number one through number 10. I cannot see if that says, if you'll come forward. Um, but there's some seats reserved here, I think, in the front. Yes. Um, if you'll come forward, we'll, we'll take speakers in the order in which you have arrived this evening. We do have a lot of speakers this evening, so I would ask that folks please try to keep to the one minute. Uh, if not, I will, I'll tell you and you'll hear the bell anyway, but, but uh, we do have a lot of speakers this evening. So with that, um, speaker number one. And if you'll please identify yourself, that would be appreciated. Thank you. Agenda item number two. I'm an HISD parent and taxpayer. No trust, no bond. Board of Managers, I appeal to you directly tonight. I am saddened that an opportunity to improve the way the district was failing too many kids has turned into such a debacle. Our teachers and principals deserve a fair, predictable, and consistently applied evaluation system as assessed by a third party. Our students deserve access to libraries, novel studies in class, and teachers that are trusted to educate them with creativity, autonomy, and joy. Our parents deserve accurate and timely information about budget, testing, and achievement measures. Our entire community deserves a school experience free of panic and fear on the day Miles Teams comes to evaluate. Information presented by this superintendent as fact is at best manipulated to serve his narrative and at worst it's just false. Promises are made and broken. I will not vote for a bond under this leadership. Board of Managers, please help correct the course and Thank you. Mr. McKenzie. My name is Larry McKenzie. <clears throat> no trust, no bonds. Satan comes to steal, kill, destroy, and lie. So if you, and, and, I, and I would like to say thank you to Mr. Ravon for voting no against Satan, I mean, Mr. Miles. And please know that even though I'm not a, a, an employee of HISD anymore, it does not make me any less of an educator. And I'm not going anywhere. My students will see me on television. My students will see me in other classes. And you have to live here after he's gone. So what I'm saying is vote no to some things that you know are affecting our students, our kids. If you'll hurt a child, that which he's doing, he'll hurt anyone. And notice that he is getting his orders from the prediction ring. Thank you. Speaker number three. Our, th our third speaker is Ms. Nuncio. Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Um, my name is Carmen Nuncio. I've been a volunteer parent with HSD for 51 years. My concern right now is our teachers and our principals. Our teachers are, they, they are at their high point of anxiety. They are worried about if they don't pass the evaluation that Mr. Miles gives them himself, um, their principals might get fired. I am so tired of the way they're being treated. The teachers should not be treated that way. The principals should not be treated there, that way. These are the people that are teaching our future. I am so happy that our wonderful elected officials are finally coming up to help us hold him accountable for what he's doing. He's doing a lot of wrong things for our kids. And that hurts me. That hurts me so bad. I'm uh, thinking that maybe the next one we should go after is Greg Abbott. He's the one behind all this. I'm Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I'm Sandra Rodriguez with Latinos for Education. I'm speaking on progress monitoring. I'd like to know how students are doing in specific programs. What are you doing to prepare emergent bilinguals and emergent bilinguals with disabilities to be TSI ready? I do appreciate you will have staff dedicated for emergent bilinguals to be TSI ready. What else are you doing to support them? I hope in future progress monitoring reports you can share specific strategies for academic support given they are one of the largest <coughs> student groups in the district. 
If we want students to enter the teaching profession, one, we need future bilingual teachers. We can build our bilingual teacher pipeline by effectively supporting emergent bilinguals. Two, we need college-ready students. So what are you doing to ensure TSI readiness for our future teacher workforce? Thank you. Thank you. My name is Emily Cole. I was a principal and a teacher in HISD in what are identified as challenging schools. Yet when you believe in students, believe in certified teachers, and believe in their academic environment, learning can take place. In fact, three books have been written describing the work we did in transforming the educational growth at Davis High School. There are five different ways that students learn, and a certified teacher knows to develop a lesson with different activities to reach the different learners in the classroom. Certified teachers are also will select from the many strategies learned on how to approach a lesson. The NES approach to teaching lessons requires a one-size-fits-all approach, and there seems to be only one teaching strategy used. Presenters that are not certified teachers can present the lesson, but they cannot teach it. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Yvonne Martinez, a 12 year PTO and former Wharton parent. Please vote yes on item eight. I used to drive every three months to Wharton to check on tours back in 2012. Why? Because I grew up in a bilingual option they had in HIC in the early 80s. My husband, whose family was born on the U.S. border, didn't produce bilingual nieces or nephews. Neither of our experiences were ideal because learning Spanish doesn't flourish until you're fully immersed in it. We were lucky to be admitted to Wharton Dual Language Magnet Program. Now my son is fully bilingual and biliterate thanks to being at Wharton from K to 8. And my son, likes to correct my Spanish every chance he gets. Thank you for listening, and si no hay confianza, no hay bono. Gracias. Thank you. Yes, my name is Jackie Anderson. I'm speaking on agenda item 12 on behalf of a teacher at a non-NES campus who fears retaliation. I'm a veteran teacher in HISD with multiple awards and a product of HISD. I believe in a challenging public school education for all children. Mike Miles is dismantling public education in HISD while claiming to be its savior. Students now come to cold, sterile warehouses. There is no laughter, no experimentation, no curiosity, no joy. We've made teachers so miserable with that many excellent teachers have left and students are revolving substitutes in their place. Like any good teacher, a good leader adjusts the plan when it's not working. Do better, Mike Miles. Let go of your one-size-fits-all model. It is not working. Give all of our students the tools and experiences they need to be successful and build a better world. No more harm. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. And if our next 10 speakers can come up, I think that's number 11 through 20. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. I'm speaking on item 3, budget. The termination of the entire library services department and replacement with lesser qualified people makes no sense. The department runs Name That Book and the Astros Literacy Bus. It trains our campus staff to teach information literacy. That includes being able to research online and separate what is real from what is not, a skill greatly needed in this AI world. And yet the department was told their rules do not align with Destination 2035. The job listings for the new roles do not require a degree in library science. The new duties are focused on inventory and HB 900 compliance, not literacy. We are not saving money by replacing our experienced certified team with people who will cost countless man hours to train. If we have enough money to spend over $719,000 on various vehicle purchases this quarter, then the district can afford to retain the current five staff members. Thank you. Our next speaker, yes, ma'am. 
Association, and I'm speaking on community engagement. Um, I stayed throughout the workshop last week because I wanted to hear your engagement plan. Um, make no mistake, public schools are the kings and queens of paper compliance. That means putting things on paper and it never really materializes into anything. And that's really what I saw take place last week because the disconnect saying that parents will be more likely to show up at a school, we can't get the parents to come to the school. The schools represent government. I'm imploring you and encourage you to think outside the box. There are numerous churches, there are numerous organizations that have space. You control the engagement. We need five good board of managers to do something that you control and you control the uh, community. Thank you. Did we skip, are, are you Jasmine? Jasmine, yes, go ahead. Hi, I'm Jasmine Kadim, and I'm speaking on item 12 on behalf of a teacher at Arabic Immersion Magnet School who fears retaliation. The current system isn't working. When parents share concerns about the administration's practices, administrators respond with harassment and retaliation against students. They gaslight parents and punish students. The executive director of support is as biased as the administration. She is inexperienced and she disregards and invalidates parents' concerns. Multiple SPED irregularities are either swept under the rug or blamed on teachers. Teachers are overworked, underappreciated, and micromanaged for every little detail, yet they are the ones being blamed for students' poor results. We need a system that's transparent, that's based on best practices, and respectful towards teachers, students, and parents. Teachers like me don't want to resign. Parents don't want to uproot their children. But sometimes we need to do what is necessary to protect ourselves. Protect us and fire Mike Miles. Hello, uh, my name is Ann Eagleton and I'm speaking about the budget. It's April 11th and we have not had one public budget workshop. No one in the public knows how much NES costs, and I'm gonna guess none of you do either. You need to make the budgeting process more transparent. There needs to be workshops that the public can attend. That is how HISD has done it for years. In addition, this is the first year in which a detailed budget book was not made and was not put on the website. No one has any idea how much anything costs. And when you don't know anything, my mind goes to it's being misused and abused. And you board of managers need to ask real questions. Mr. Rivon is the only one that's starting to ask questions and pushing back. This is two and a half billion dollars and you are treating this like you're at, a, at the River Oaks Garden Party or something. Transparency now. Thank you. Mr. Harrell. Hassan Harrell, Magnet Parent, Agenda Item 9. Warden needs to be designated a separate and unique school. First effect, in the 22-23 school year, campus demographic reported that 492 of the 627 students enrolled at Warden were transfers into the school coming from 130 different schools. Now I will cite statements made by HISD on Magnet programs. HISD magnet programs serve as a bridge for our children and families to access unique opportunities, transformative experiences, and exposure to innovative careers. These specialized programs are designed to create a well-rounded and engaged student body ready to take on the challenges of an at times uncertain future. The assortment of magnet themes and options are a testament to our philosophy in HISD that our students can be anything they set their mind to and we as educators are here to help get them there. Make warden, <coughs> um, designate warden, please. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you, you too. All right, um, our next speaker, yes ma'am, please go ahead. My name is Cora Noel, taxpayer and future ASD parent. 
Um, I have the privilege tonight of speaking on behalf of a teacher at an NES school who cannot speak for fear of retaliation. On item number 12, five years ago, I began my teaching journey at a school that had a revolving door of teachers. Between then and May 2023, a low-performing culture was transformed to an amazing school. Social emotional learning was embedded into the school culture. Students felt seen and families felt connected. That all came crumbling down on June 1st when we all had to reapply for our own positions. Many left for other districts. Today, I want to resign and find a happier, more joyful place to teach. Our school that was once flourishing is now an NES prison. The lack of social emotional learning is killing our students' love of learning. The lack of differentiated instruction is ripping our school to pieces. Teachers are leaving and our students are suffering. When Mike Miles leaves, who will be left to pick up the pieces? Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. I'm Iris Wardle, and I'm here to address agenda number nine. I'm a zone parent to a second grader, and I hope rising pre-K pre -K four at Wharton. The bilingual IB program is exceptional. It provides students with fluency in Spanish and a deep understanding of global cultures. I am for keeping it a dual language school. When we purchased our home in Montrose, we specifically sought a home that would give our children the opportunity to attend Wharton, as we were drawn to the impeccable reputation in its bilingual program. As decisions are made about the school's future, please consider the impact on current zone families and the communities that we have built around the school, around this school. Converting Morton into a magnet only school will directly affect me and my neighbors. I thank you for keeping and helping it, um, keeping it as the school-wide 80-20 dual language program, but please consider to expand pre-K in its existing dual language setting and please help protect the neighborhood school option. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. My name is Geraldine Ruolt. I'm here to address agenda item number nine. I'm a French and zone parent of a second grader, a kindergartner, and a future student at Wharton. I deliberately chose to settle in the, in the neighborhood, making sacrifices along the way to be part of its vibrant and diverse com community. One of the key decisions in settling here was to enroll my children in our neighborhood school, Warden Dual Language Academy. It was driven by the desire for them to benefit from the exceptional bilingual immersion program offered at Wharton. The language skills and cross-cultural empathy fostered by this school-wide program are invaluable, shaping our children into global citizens. Changing Wharton into a magnet-only school overlooks the nearby families and what they bring to the school. I think both the zone families and those in the magnet program play a part in making the school successful. I encourage you not to make Wharton a magnet-only school and consider the impact on current families and the broader Montrose community. Thank you. Thank you. If our next um, speakers will come forward, I think I have uh, Geraldine Roalt. Hello, my name is Allison Esenkova, and I'm speaking on agenda number nine for Wharton. Go ahead. Okay, we can hear. Pardon me. Um, so I'm a parent of two children at Wharton who are in seventh grade, and I'd like to introduce Max and Katya. Hello. Okay. Thank you for the opportunity to be bilingual. It helps me really well com to communicate with people who don't speak English or can only speak Spanish. Thank you. Gracias por la oportunidad de ser bilingüe, porque me ayuda a ser, me ayuda a comunicar con diferentes culturas. Gracias. We are also a neighborhood family, and we are asking that as you work, and we're thankful that you're working to protect the dual language program, that you also fully consider the implications for our neighborhood. We have families who are coming together, and we're willing to share our results of our focus groups with you, as well as any documentation that we've produced from that, and we're happy to keep collaborate, collaborating. Hope you see that the Wharton families have been coming to you with a lot of respect and trying to engage correctly. Thank you. Thank you. I think we skipped Miss Geraldine oh, Roth. Oh, so so oh, okay. No worries. Go ahead. Okay. Yes. Trang Hickman, agenda item nine. Good evening, board and superintendent. Thank you to you and district administrators for your responsiveness and attention to the future of the campus-wide dual language immersion programs at Wharton and Helms. The designation of Wharton as a separate and unique school 
comes with many implementation and transition questions. However, I encourage you to approve this new designation to ensure Wharton can continue to attract and serve the linguistically and economically diverse mix of students who succeed academically within it. I also ask that you further engage with families who may be affected by any changes as a result of this decision to find a collaborative solution. They are a part of Wharton's neighborhood and community. Finally, I ask that you consider opportunities to expand Spanish dual language immersion programs district-wide to further share the benefits and to meet the excess demand seen in the volume of magnet applications we receive. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hello, I'm Amanda Serena. Um, our district has at-risk, underserved students who have been let down by the adults in leadership for years. This is where your attention should be. Mr. Miles' short-sighted, one-size-fits-all approach has impacted all of our dynamic Houston ISD campuses, and the non-proven NES policies are spreading. Leadership teams at A and B schools have been demoralized, and good teachers have been told they should leave if they're not up for the high-performance culture. Inconsistent, subjective um, evaluations used as fear tactics with ever-changing goalposts. Miles' overreach is focused on creating a perception that many good schools are also failing to justify the misguided policies rather than focusing on the truly struggling schools. His increased scope has ensured that all Houston ISD students are being detrimentally impacted by the destabilization these policies have created through the pressure, stress, and threats felt by our teachers and admin teams. Our kids pay the price for this. You've created a system that puts the burden of earned autonomy Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker, Angelina Serena. Okay, great. Okay. Jay Pellegrino. Yeah. Hi, Jay yes, Pellegrino. Good evening. Um, so I'm here as a concerned parent whose daughter is poised to start at Wharton in the next couple of years. I um, strongly advocate for Wharton to not be a separate and unique school and to keep its neighborhood zoning. I urge the board to delay any decision until there's sufficient public discourse and adequate discussion. To be clear, I'm fully supportive of Wharton keeping its dual language program. Given our diverse city, I recommend you to prioritize creating more dual language programs across our district, not taking it away from my neighborhood. Learning of Mr. Miles' proposals through a Facebook group this week is unacceptable. It's critical that you inform and seek input beyond the current Wharton principal and current families for whom the proposed changes will have little if no impact. They represent only a partial and biased portion of our neighborhood. It's also highly inappropriate for you to decide today before you Think. act to quote to turn and have that Thank you, ma'am. Thank, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Ma'am, you're over time. We've got a lot of speakers. Thank you very much. I think I see a student speaker. Okay, come on up behind. Are you? You look like you look younger than the rest of us, so you must be a student speaker. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> Hello. My name is Bennett Faulkner, and I'm speaking on item four on behalf of a teacher at a non-NES school who fears retaliation. Money should be budgeted for robotics programs. A robotics program offers students the chance to engage with cutting-edge technology and industry standard tools, providing them with a competitive edge in robots and engineering. By gaining hands-on experience with state-of-the-art equipment and software, students have been able to stay abreast of advancements in the field and develop a deep understanding of emerging technologies. In line with the vision of promoting student success, the robotics program has also emphasized mentorship and guidance. I have helped students identify their strengths, set goals, and navigate challenges through personalized mentorship, fostering a sense of purpose and direction in their academic and professional journeys. Mr. Miles, cutting robotics from the NES schools is a disgrace, and I implore you to ensure robotics coaches and resources are funded in all schools. No trust, no bond. Thank you. Our next speaker is uh, Mark LeBlanc. Yes, sir. Mark LeBlanc, Agenda Item 7. Culture precedes positive results. 
Culture is based on trust. And when there are abusive power and control tactics, plus information manipulation, that trust is eroded. Only acknowledging positive while severely downplaying negative details, controlling media, historical revisionism, backpedaling, and the constant control by chaos are forms of manipulation of public opinion. These, plus marginalizing dissent, are key elements of the Russian propaganda model. One already knew that. China's Mao Zedong used Lenin's model as a tool of mass propaganda and agitation. Now we find the Confucius Institute is going to indoctrinate HISD children with messages funded by the Chinese government. Are we led by a blue jay or a blue falcon? You, the board, have a fiduciary responsibility to the taxpaying members of this community. Information that is misleading is not analytical, even if it pretends to be. You must recognize logical fallacies. And when parents are discussing HISD's manipulation of APR data to potentially hide sped legal infractions, the board should take notice. This Thank is you, not sir. Risk allocation. Thank you. It is your legacy. Thank you. Ms. Estes, please go ahead. Hi. Good evening. My name is Catherine Estes. I'm the mother of two HISD students. I'm also a widow of a former HISD H educator. I'll be speaking on item number three on behalf of a teacher of a non-NES school who cannot speak for fear of retaliation. I have taught for 30 years, the last decade in HISD. In June, when I will, I will be resigning. I should have resigned in August, but my classes require an advanced degree and I couldn't leave my students. I have endured a year of micromanagement by administrators who fear losing their jobs and if I don't follow HISD's one-size-fits-all model. This fall, I'll be teaching the same classes but in a district that values my experience and expertise. I will miss my students and my colleagues, but I will not miss the unelected, unaccountable leadership that is driving away good educators, board of managers, be aware that the students' test scores will plummet unless you drive away Mike Miles instead. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Draper, please go ahead. My name is Genesis Draper. Thank you for listening to the concerns and the feedback of parents, children, and community members regarding preserving the school-wide dual-language Spanish immersion program at Wharton. Of the utmost importance to me is maintaining the integrity of Wharton's excellent dual-language program and making the opportunity equally available to children across the district. The recommendation to designate Wharton a separate and unique school and maintain the school-wide dual-language model there does just that. Research shows that dual language learning improves brain dexterity and cognitive skills, benefits that extend past acquiring another language. We have a second grader at Warden and a fifth grader at the Arabic Immersion School because the gift of bilingualism was something we desperately wanted to give our children. I acknowledge that this is a bittersweet step forward for our school community as zone families struggle with the impact this will have on our neighborhood feel. However, I do support the recommendation to preserve Wharton as a school-wide dual language program and to make the program equally available to all in the district. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Leslie Santamaria, third generation HISD graduate, raising the fourth. Speaking on agenda item three on behalf of the teacher at a non-NES school who is afraid of retaliation. Last month, Ms. Flowers asked about multiple response strategies at a non-NES schools. Mr. Miles said that other engagement strategies not on the MRS list, such as gallery walks, would suffice during a spot observation for a non-NES teacher. However, what Mr. Miles said to the public is not the same message that non-NES campuses receive. Administrators rave that I have a fully engaged classroom where students work together on class tasks, yet my spot scores are low for not implementing approved MRS strategies. There is mixed messaging going on. Therefore, I urge the board to make the spot appraisal guidebooks public for transparency and deeper understanding. Only a strong appraisal system that is transparent and calibrated can help improve school outcomes. No trust, no bond. The next speaker is Ms. Moore. I am Lisa Moore. I am an HISD parent. Members of the board, respectfully, certified teacher turnover is a major threat to student achievement. Please use your power to hold this administration accountable to creating a positive culture as you would expect in your own workplaces. Right now, unfortunately, you are complicit in the harm being done. 
I will read a statement from a teacher at a non-NES school. It is unfortunate and dystopian that I need to read this anonymous statement, but that's where we're at today. I have poured my heart and soul into building a successful theater program that has brought joy and inspiration into the lives of students and families. But now my stage sits empty, a stark reminder of the impact that Mike Miles' changes have had on our program. Since he arrived, morale among teachers and staff is at an all-time low, and many are actively seeking new job opportunities. I, too, have decided to leave my position in June. It is my hope that the empty stage will be Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Our next speaker is Denise Wilborn. Is she here? Ms. Wilborn? Uh, Sandra Ramos? Or maybe we may have it out of order if y'all. Do I need phone? 25. It's fine. It's I, fine. I mean, it's, just go ahead. <laughs> My name is Sandra Monsalve Ramos, and I'm talking about agenda number nine. Good afternoon. Thank you for taking into consideration the input and suggestions presented by the Wharton families about our immersive <laughs> Spanish program. Today, we ask you to approve Wharton to become a separate and unique school. Keeping the Spanish immersion program as a magnet school benefits the diversity of the program enriched by students from different socioeconomic backgrounds and neighborhoods around the city. Being bilingual supports the development of a greater understanding and appreciation for different cultures and perspectives and gives to our kids opportunities that otherwise they wouldn't even consider or have access to. Thank you for considering the Zone families attending Wharton. The dual language education is very important for them and it's only fair to let them continue with the, immers with the immersive dual language, language education. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Speaker number 25. Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Number 25. <laughs> is my mic on? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Dr. Denise Wilborn, again. Item 12, speaking for a teacher at a non-NES school who fears re retaliation and likely to resign. When Gregor of Kafka's The Metamorphosis wakes up as a giant bug, he doesn't try to figure out why. He doesn't waste time examining his new body. He strains within the limitations of the heaviness, the spindly weak legs in an attempt to get to his job for fear of what will happen if he doesn't meet the expectations. Like Gregor, when we teachers woke with the weight of a classroom timer around our necks and Miles' fear in our throats, to preserve what was left of our spirits, many of us didn't stop to examine the horror we now existed in. We simply strained within the checklist, fighting to do what was always been expected of us, to love and teach our kids. We no longer exist within public education, Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Our next speaker, Ms. Fisher. Hi, my name Hi. is Sarah Fisher. I'm an HASD parent, and I'm speaking on item 12. And on behalf of a teacher who at an NES school, excuse, excuse me, who fears retaliation, I find it deeply unfair. As both a teacher and a mother, I've missed countless precious moments. After a long day at school, I return home only to immerse myself in lengthy lesson preparations and other daily tasks, all in anticipation of the next day's teaching. Yet in doing so, I've come to realize the extent of what I've sacrificed, those cherished moments with my family that every human being deserves. I know I'm not alone in feeling this way. Many of my colleagues share these sentiments. We have little time on this earth, and we can't predict how much time we have left. Frankly, I yearn to reclaim my life. I want to spend my precious moments with loved ones, doing work that fulfills me in an environment that values me. This is not in HISD. And speaking for myself, so many of our certified teachers are fleeing the district. Why are you okay with brain brain? Thank you. Ms. Hambos, and then if our next speakers, um, 29 or 30 through 39, if you'd come forward. 
Buenas, Buenas noches. Okay. Mi nombre es Jessica Campos. Voy a dar mi testimonio primero en español porque está en español y después voy a dejar que ella lo dé. Well, okay. Um, hola. Eh, estoy hablando en el nombre de una maestra anónima de ESL con temor de rep represalias. Mi solicitud a la mesa directiva es de que apoyen a los maestros expertos que saben cuáles son los niveles de sus estudiantes. Algunos de los estudiantes nunca han tenido una educación formal. Algunos conocen varios idiomas con mayor potencial de excelencia, pero el seguimiento de sus progresos les falla en, comp en comparación a la población general. Nuestros estudiantes vienen de diferentes intervales eh, del año, eh, el calendario escolar. Mi, solitud, mi solicitud a la Junta es exigir que evalúen en comparativo eh, prueba de, de crecimiento antes de que sean margin, margin, marginados y contabilizados en las calificaciones, eh, calificaciones escolares. No tenemos un plan de estudiante para los recién llegados y los profesores que do, dominan varios idiomas con años de experiencia ni siquiera forman parte del plan de los estudiantes para, para recién llegados. Valoren a los comentarios de los maestros para, ayudar a los, para ayudarnos a mantener el cumplimiento para que ningún niño del HISD se quede atrás. I'm here to speak on behalf of an ESL teacher that fears re, uh, retaliation. My request to the board is to support experienced teachers who know the level of our students are on the level which our students are on. Some of the students I teach have never had a formal education. Some know several languages with greater potential for excellence, but their monitoring, but the monitoring of their goals has failed them compared to the general population. Our students come at different intervals in the school calendar. My request to the board is to demand comparative evaluations and growth uh, tests before they are marginalized and counted in school grades. We do not have a curriculum for newcomers and teachers who master several languages and have many years of experience are not even part of the drafting of the curriculum. Value of teaching and feedback to teachers to help us Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Superintendent, uh, members of the board, my name is Lucas Majorens. Um, my daughter is a student at Wharton Elementary where she receives a luxurious education, and I don't use that term lightly. My family and I are very grateful for that opportunity as we are for your decision to keep the school 100% bilingual. This decision not only benefits current students, but also many other children in the future. I understand there are details that still need to be figured out for zoned parents and uh, polished, especially in terms of communication. But I believe that we're moving in the right direction. Thank you very much. Thank you. Ms. Jones. Hi, um, my name is Marcy Jones. I'm speaking about teacher retention. Um, hello, I'm an HISD parent of a second grader at a non-NES school. My son has always really enjoyed school. He would look forward to going each day, seeing his friends and his loving and dedicated teachers. But now he complains daily. One of his precious teachers is leaving the district at the end of this year. She has taught in the district for over 20 years, but is exhausted by the lack of trust from this board for her to do her job. He knows she is leaving, but says she's retiring. The truth is she's leaving to take her talents to a different district. His beloved first grade teacher left last year after only four weeks at the beginning of this year. Also exhausted by the control and the scare tactic, tactics that this board uses. My middle schooler also at a non-NES school knows how to act when a district walkthrough happens. He wants to protect his teacher and make sure that everything goes right so they will leave his school alone. When these amazing teachers leave, who will be left? The bottom of the barrel. Stop driving off our educators. No trust, no bond. Yes, ma'am. My, my name is Lisa Weiss, and I'm a parent of a child at a non-NES elementary school. I'm speaking on item number 12, termination of employment. I'm speaking on behalf of a non-NES teacher who is afraid of retaliation and therefore resigning. Um, in her words, I have cried so much in the last two weeks. I told my students and my school community that I won't, won't be returning next year. Having dedicated 
The past 10 years at my school, I thought I would celebrate my retirement there. However, after this year, I have decided that I cannot work in HISD's toxic environment anymore. I can no longer tolerate the low morale, the loss of teacher autonomy, stifling of creativity, ridiculous expectations that are a complete waste of time, dumb spot forms that don't take into account our creative gifts and differences. Mr. Miles, if you cannot respect teachers and their profession, then you need to leave HISD. Board of Managers, if you can't do this, then expect Thank you. I think we skipped Ms. Acosta. Is that you, Ms. Acosta? Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, um, my name is Christina Acosta, and I'm speaking on behalf of an administrator at a non NES school who cannot speak for fear of retaliation. I'm a proud, over 12 years BIPs approved parent. I do not work. Um, HISD does not pay me. So, bilingual curriculum resources are not bilingual. The district's curriculum department continues to only translate every other unit. <coughs> so bilingual teachers are spending hours every week, every day, translating entire units of ELA, lesson materials, LOs, and DOLs created by HISD. These actions seem like Mike Miles wants to get rid of bilingual education. And even the dual language programs are not true, 50-50 anymore. Every other unit does not give students the practice they need to be fluent in either language. Having to spend hours translating the other units on top of other planning efforts makes educators want to resign, give teachers all materials they need, and bring back the parent-approved bilingual and dual language education that our bilingual children deserve. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Hi. My name is Katherine Kennedy, parent-speaking on behalf of... Our, our parent-speaking on item 12. I'm also speaking on behalf of a teacher at a non-NES school planning their resignation due to lack of trust and are yet afraid of retaliation. Everything that Mr. Miles has asked of us, I have adapted to for my students and most importantly to support my wonderful principal. I was an exemplary one teacher in both my observations and MOI scores. However, something changed mid-year. I didn't become a bad teacher. I didn't stop following the mandates of Mr. Miles. No, the goalpost was changed. My administration, like all others, was given new guidance. In an effort to make sure I fit into Mr. Miles' bell curve, this once exemplary one teacher fell two notches to proficient one. Soon, I will be resigning. I have been to four interviews in other districts and have received four job offers. So thank you, Mr. Miles, for showing me my worth and motivating me to find a democratic district that values their teachers. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Holly Kramer. I'm a parent of two children in non-NES schools. I'm speaking on behalf of a teacher at a non-NES school who fears retaliation. For many years, I have dedicated my life to fine arts and sharing my love of music, art, and theater with my students. I hope that someday my students would be world famous musicians, artists, and actors. In this NES alternative universe we are living in HISD, it breaks my heart to see the opportunities for our students diminish and their creativity stifled. It's ironic that Mike Miles finds validation in theater and yet doesn't value teachers in these areas. In fact, school administrators who lack theater background consistently evaluate my passion and expertise as low scores. I am sad to leave my students, but morally, I cannot compromise princ my principles to comply with the one-size-fits-all one expectations in the Mike Miles regime. Therefore, I will join the mass exodus of teachers resigning from HISD. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Dr. Ruth hoffman Lack. It's difficult to deliver a one-minute comment without sounding angry. Uh, tonight, speaking as an owner, I actually am angry on your behalf. The report on packet pages 15 through 22 is pitiful. Because, besides grammatical and logical errors, the two citations listed on page 18 are false. The report claims research shows that college readiness bridge programs have a great impact on SWD's success when transitioning to post-secondary education, and cites Lynn Stingari, et cetera, 2021. Does not include a title or a journal. 
A Google Scholar search found a study of a whopping 65 Indonesian students aimed at confirming the influence of college readiness on college engagement on students with disabilities. There is no mention of college readiness bridge programs at all, none. In the next sentence, there is a citation for Cambridge Press 2019, which could refer to literally anything published by Cambridge in 2019. Literally anything. <laughs> Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Ma'am, thank you. Thank you. Your time is up. Thank you. Our next speaker, Ms. Sandcastle, Sandra Sandcastle. Is she here? I have her as speaker number 36. Oh, is that you, ma'am? Yes. Okay. Good afternoon. I am a first grade certified bilingual dual language teacher here to address item nine. Mr. Miles, you acknowledge to the Houston Press that it's not that you are against bilingual, but instead prefer dual language. In dual language classes at NES and NESA schools, science of reading is taught in English. It would be more beneficial for reading to be taught in Spanish. Studies have shown that understanding the relationship between the spoken language and the written word transfers from one language to another. To reach destination 2035, you need to use proven language acquisition strategies like the 80-20 model used by Helms and Wharton. Not only do emergent bilingual students succeed and have pride in their heritage, but all students have better academic outcomes and career opportunities. I urge the board to continue allowing parents to choose programs where students develop initial literacy in Spanish. Ms. Lyman. Tracy Lyman or Lehman? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Tracy Lyman. I'm speaking on agenda 15, item 15. In honor of Child Abuse Awareness Month, I'm speaking on behalf of a teacher who has witnessed child abuse at his school. The principal that was appointed to our school had never led a school for more than a year. He had never been a principal in a high school. He didn't know our population of students and the struggles our immigrant students face. From audio recordings of him threatening teachers in unannounced meetings to video recordings of him bullying teachers in front of the students. Is he leading by example or creating a culture of abuse? Board members, please have an anonymous survey for students and staff at least once a semester to check in with our emotional well-being. This survey could provide the option to be contacted and future solutions for the well-being of our schools. This survey Thank you. Ms. Morgan. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Katie Morgan. I am a Wharton parent. Thank you. Thank you for recognizing how special our community is how special our school is, and how special our neighborhood is. You heard Luca speak on behalf of my son, who is a special education and GT student. We are very proud to be at Warden, and that community has been established by the combination of magnet and neighborhood families. I ask that you please recognize and continue our Spanish immersion program and include our neighborhood, our neighborhood where families live, our neighborhood where we have old and young, the neighborhood where when a magnet parent needs somewhere for their kid to go, they come to my house. We love being at Wharton and we hope it continues in the same way and look to you to keep us neighborhood and magnet together. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening on item nine. My three kids are in the Spanish Immersion Program and we love it. Uh, Wharton is big enough to accommodate zoned English speakers. Uh, rezoning an entire neighborhood of 219 students from an A-rated school to an F-rated school goes directly against the board's mandate to improve student outcomes. Regardless, resolving to form a committee is not a solution that any of you or I would ever consider in business. At a minimum, the, the resolution should have the solution that you're voting on contained in it. 
Lastly, rezoning to a failing school in the face of opposition to English language instruction is almost certainly going to violate recent Supreme Court interpretations of federal law. I realize that adding an English language pre-K was probably an attempt to comply, but rezoning will create much more exposure by excluding rather than including. Please preserve both Spanish immersion and accommodate the zoned English speakers. Thank you. Thank you so much. Ms. Candida. No trust, no bond. My name is Diana Candida, here to speak on item nine. Superintendent Miles, as you impose the, your destructive policies and ideas on more schools in HISD, you anger an increasing number of Houston citizens. Most recently, you've caught the attention of Wharton and Helms parents and others who believe in additive bilingual education versus inferior dual language system you boastfully claim to have expanded. I believe you, Mr. Miles, were picked by Abbott not based on the merits of your educational philosophy, but because of its and your past failures. <laughs> Nobody wants their children or teachers to, they love to suffer because corrupt politicians want to line their pockets. As evidenced by the growing number of speakers and protests, the more damage you inflict on HISD, the more resistance you will meet. We are taxpayers and want democracy restored to our school system. The unelected board members are not brave enough to fire you, but I suspect that if you resign, they will not try to dissuade you. Please resign. If our next group of speakers can please come forward. Speakers 40 through 50, if you'll please come forward. And our next speaker, I think, is Esther Uribe. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Happy School Library Month. It is Take Action, National Take Action for Libraries Day. So, as an HISD librarian, parent, and concerned community member, I am calling on the Board of Managers to take action to save our school libraries. Superintendent Miles was quoted saying, yeah, I'd rather have a high-quality teacher getting paid a lot then have a librarian doing what? Checking out books? Guess what? We are not just acting like teachers. We are high quality certified teachers with master's degrees. And we do a whole lot more than just check out books. We are information literacy teachers, reading teachers, curriculum designers, instructional coaches, instructional technology specialists, program administrators, budget managers, resource specialists, and librarians. We fulfill the functions of more than eight different positions for the low, low price of one. With all our additional training, experience, and skills, certified librarians are our district's biggest Thank bargain. you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, your time, ma'am. Thank you. Our next speaker. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Go ahead. Is it on? I just want to make sure you can hear me this time. We In can June, I was one of the new faces, but you called me anxious about change when I asked you to not force my kids' teachers through reconstitution. In December, you called me a naysayer when I said my students should be allowed to use the restroom. In March, you called me a usual suspect when I said that my kids' teachers after reconstitution are now uncertified in a revolving door of substitutes. And now you can just call me resigned because I'm an experienced, certified, dedicated ESL teacher, but no longer here. Not after you took out the joy, the humanity, the creativity, and the inquiry from our classrooms. So you're likely to see a lot of old faces and new faces between now and the time that you leave. So remember that a leader with integrity and intelligence would listen and consider every single one. Thank you. Our next speaker. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Good evening. I am also a naysayer and also a usual suspect who has been attending since, uh, since August. I have just a list of questions for Board of Managers. The first one, if you chose to serve on this temporary board, was it to serve children? How is that working out for you? Why does this board deliberate in private and rubber stamp in public? The law requires public deliberation. 
Have you requested data or research for the NES experiment being conducted in HISD? Is there any data? Is there any research? Is it an experiment? It is your duty to find out. Would you allow your students to attend? Would you enroll your students in Third Future Schools? Why do you allow Mr. Miles to continue to work at Third Future Schools while working for HISD? That's not okay. Why are Thank you, ma'am. Thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. No no Our next speaker. Dr. Pamela Bovelin, and I'm speaking on behalf of a teacher at a non-NES school who <laughs> cannot speak for fear of retaliation. That seems to be a theme tonight. I'm speaking against item 23, the issuance of bonds. This Board of Managers has shown that they cannot re rein in the bad fiscal decisions and hateful policies of this appointed superintendent. Mr. Miles cannot engage employees in a respectful manner. This, can, this causes over 800 teachers to leave HISD under his mean-spirited, egotistical leadership thus far. Miles cannot be trusted to be transparent with $160 million. He has overpromised, underestimated the exorbitant cost of his flawed NES, NESA system, which may be running out of funds, like Third Futures Network. Thank you, ma'am. Our next speaker is Claire Robinson. Yes, ma'am. Claire Robinson speaking on item 12 on behalf of a teacher at an NES school who fears retaliation. It has been a rough year. Mr. Miles said that his evaluation system would end favoritism in teacher evaluations, but the opposite is happening. Administrators can, give, can be biased and, and unethical, giving low scores with little feedback. I've had to deal with that this year, and honestly, if it wasn't for the students, I would have left already. A lot of teachers are unhappy, and it's showing. I want to stay at my school because the students are amazing, but Mr. Miles' policies and toxic work culture have me thinking about quitting HISD. The board can change this. How many teachers, community members, and students have to tell you that the district is on fire before you call the fire department? Yes, fire Mike Miles. Thank you. Mr. Abazadian. <laughs> On the topic of abuse, I'm a male teacher in the classroom. Some of these children listen to me more because they don't have other male figures around, which is why it's so important we sent competent men into Sharpstown. You think you're good for H-Town, but Mr. Miles, your golden son was recorded screaming at students about wearing Crocs. Disrespectful talk from someone who walked into the school in Crocs. And you're moving in lockstep, letting him know he's in the right there. You're perpetuating a culture of fear. You praise our abusive superiors. My boss yells with such force that spittle flies from his face and onto the floor between him and child expressing a need. And what's funny is I know he's scared of you too. He lies to you about the number of teachers who have left the school to appear more effective. In reality, 32 educators have left. So far, our principal, who so easily bent and afraid, then as a community, we'll take Mike Miles back to whence he came. We need to reorganize the little TA because we've lost faith in a structure that promotes harmful practices that abuse children, like putting unqualified, vindictive, nepotistic conflict of interest in charge of Houston Independent School District. Yes. Mindon Tran speaking on item 15, bullying. Um, I'm speaking on behalf of myself today. Um, you've heard from a lot of parents and teachers at some good schools. Today I'm here to tell you about a bad principal. Um, over 30 teachers have left our school this year by January. The APs who left told me they could not stay in HISD in good conscience, 
quote, I was done with all the negativity and things we were being made to do that I feel were not right to some teachers, end quote. That's from an AP. Another one said, I could not work with that man. He was referring to our principal who bullies both students and teachers. Teachers, grown adults will cross to the other side of the hall when they see him coming because they feel uncomfortable around him. My students won't go to the restroom if they know that he's outside because they're afraid of him. That is not leadership. A recording of our principal went viral as he berated students and threatened to prevent them from graduating for simple dress code violations. He's repeatedly called our school, our students, and our community ghetto. He does not respect our community that he is supposed to be a part of. Thank you. Ms. Williams. Hello, my name is Rebecca Williams, one of the teachers that you are firing. Um, it is easier to build strong children than to fix broken men. Frederick Douglass, 1862. Learning objective. What Mike Miles has not provided for children? A conducive learning environment. You have had teachers being observed in extreme heat. You've had uh, teachers being observed in arduous cold. Audrey's calls. Schools have operated powerless in no water. Schools have even run out of food. You don't consult parents and teachers and principals who directly work with children and disrupt the environments with your nonsensical practices. I teach history just to make sure that my students don't become a leader like you. Inefficient, ineffective, pseudo-intelligent. You are mediocre at best and piss poor at worst. What would your spot observation say? Jillian Bauer. My name is Jillian Boyer, and I'm speaking on item 12, and on behalf of a teacher at a non-NES school who fears retaliation. After two decades in HISD, I have decided to resign due to the bullying that my students and I have endured. As caring teachers, we take the Sandy Hook promise seriously to prevent bullying. But now, not only are the administrators bullying teachers, but they are also being abusive to our students. Our principal almost hit one of my students, and nothing has been done about it. Our students are learning that those who stand up to bullies are being sent home silenced, while the bullies are being promoted. Many of our students come from abusive homes or have experienced other trauma. They need to feel safe at school. Yet HISD has taken away our resources to provide them support. We must create a safe environment for our students. I implore the Board of Managers to protect our students. In honor of Child Abuse Awareness Month, let's be reminded that we have the power to stop abuse. Thank you. If speakers 50 and 50 through 60 would please come forward. Yes, ma'am. Please go ahead. Good evening. My name is Warefta. I'm a parent of two kids in non-NES schools. I'm speaking, on I'm speaking on item 12 and on behalf of Callie Bennis, former manager of HISD Library Services. Yes, library. As a parent of HISD students and lifelong educator, I want nothing more than to see the district and its children succeed. The first line of defense against illiteracy is to get books into the hands of our children Yet approximately one-third of all HISD school libraries are closed. A certified professional librarian is integral in connecting students, staff, and families to resources they need. Whether it be research materials, reading for pleasure, or websites to help a teacher facilitate a class, it's a school librarian who connects users to resources. It is critical that we prioritize a fully functional library in every HISD school. And if Mike Miles doesn't want a librarian, thank, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. I think our next speaker is Heather Taylor. Heather Taylor? Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name's Heather Taylor. Um, I am a parent of a fourth grade student. He is an avid reader and an early finisher. He would not survive in an NES school. One of our favorite days of the week is Library Day. Our campus library is a ray of sunshine in our Title I school. It is the reason why many parents choose to send their children to the, our campus. Last year, teachers and parents fought to keep our librarian when we were um, facing budget cuts. She is the common thread. She knows every student, their abilities, and their interests. 
If good reading is our goal, let them read books. How will students be prepared for high school or higher education if they're not encouraged to explore in their learning? I will not support a bond that does not support school libraries. No trust, no bond. Ms. Reed. Yes, Hello, my name is Tammy Reed, and I teach theater at Fur High School. Um, I uh, came to HISD again to uh, start a strong theater program, and I haven't because of NES practices. However, I'm not going to talk about that. I'm going to talk about um, item four on behalf of a teacher at a non-ES school, NES school, who fears retaliation. Mr. Miles, I know that many of the speakers this evening intend to belittle you about your ineptitude and incompetence, but I admire your commitment to the cause. Now, I admit cutting stipends to coaches for robotics, Spanish, debate, mathematics, poetry, and journalism is a daring strategy. You are doubling down on the idea that low-income children can only be expected to achieve success through athletics or as entertainers and should forgo academic or scientific pursuits, training them to be competitive. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Your ma'am. Your time is up. Thank you. Ma'am, ma'am, this is your warning. Please stop talking. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ruth Kravitz. Oh, Beth Caldwell. Ms. Caldwell, please go ahead. Good evening. I'm here in regard to teacher retention. I speak on behalf of a teacher who worked under Mike Miles in Colorado Springs. This person states, Mike Miles destroys every school he touches. He cares more about standardized score reports in the newspaper than actual cognitive growth. Mike Miles hasn't improved a single district he's been tasked with leading. His track record of staff turnover rates speak for themselves. In Dallas ISD, his teacher turnover rate was 22%, much higher than the state average. If we see similar rates, we can expect over 2,000 teachers to leave HISD. Based on this teacher's feedback, and those are the voices we've heard here tonight, I have no trust in Mike Miles. No trust, no bond. Our next speaker is Ruth Kravitz. Yes, ma'am. Uh, good evening. I just got something in an email, so I'm changing my speech a little. A student sibling passed away recently. The counselor asked if she could skip their after-school PD that takes place every Thursday so she can go to the wake to show support for the grieving family. The principal denied her request, stating that they shouldn't have scheduled it on a Thursday. This is the heartless culture that you have created. In NES schools, Miles has forced even young children to take four tests every day all year long. That really is test prep gone wild. So parents are opting out of STAR. TEA allows it. And you can learn more about it at optouttexas.net. If STAR were low stakes used to identify where to put more resources, I would be all for it. But STAR is incredibly high stakes. It is used to fire teachers, shame children, narrow the curriculum, and take over school districts. Texas is one of only eight states to use standardized testing for graduation, and only one of nine states to use eight. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Heiner. Yes, ma'am. Hello, usual suspect, number 54, but I come with my prediction ring like Miles. This week, state representatives visited my neighborhood NESA school, Wainwright Elementary. On paper, our campus has a Spanish dual language program, but our state reps were denied access to this program. At the start of the year, our principal could not tell me what a dual language program looked like under NESA and referred me to Ms. Monreal, the head of multilingual. Monreal assured me that the dual language program at Wainwright would continue to be taught half in English and half in Spanish, but she could not tell me which classes would be in Spanish and which would be in English. Many in our community are reporting that the program is not 50-50. Managers, Mr. Miles needs to show you his NESA or NES dual language curriculum map to ensure emergent bilingual students are receiving the dual language program they are legally, legally entitled to under Texas law. Miles has continuously misrepresented data and misled you. No trust, no bond. 
Ms. Padgett. Hi, my name is Carly, and I'm speaking on behalf of Ms. Namani, a non-NES teacher who could not be here today. She writes, I am a 30-year veteran teacher in HISD, and for 29 years I have served the same school and its community. For the last 10 years, I have taught my ex-students children, whom I call my grandchildren. It saddens me to watch these children daily decline academically. Instead of closing the achievement gap, you have made it as wide as a seven-lane freeway. Tyrant Mike. I want you and your board to know that most teachers do not leave a school or district because of challenging students. In most cases, they have because their school administration or personal reasons. However, this year is totally different. Thousands of veteran teachers like myself will be leaving HISD because of you, Tyrant Mike. You are single-handedly damaging our children. You must quit now. Time's up. Your day of reckoning is coming. Your conscience... Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ms. Cruz, thank you for being with us, Ms. Cruz. Buenas noches. I am encouraged to see that access to take a TSI exam has increased. A passing TSI score opens the door to a student's future, and especially of following the path to college. However, there are clear disparities, and especially with students with special needs and emergent bilingual students. I respectfully ask the district to publish an analysis of how to maximize the CCMR outcomes bonus funding with the potential to bring in millions of more dollars of revenue and put students on a clearer post-secondary path. And I respectfully ask that you consider reinvesting 100% of the CCMR outcomes bonus dollars into preparing students for college and career, such as more college advisors, not less. Gracias. Thank you. Our next speaker, Yen Rabe. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Good evening. My name is Yen Rabe. I'm an educator, property taxpayer, and the Houston area chapter leader of Start School Later. Uh, I am speaking on item number 23 and number four. It's tax season. How are taxes used efficiently and effectively? when up to 70% of our middle and high school students are not getting adequate sleep, when Billy Reagan, K-8, through and certain middle and high schools in the district start as early as 7.40 in the morning. It's also not equitable nor safe for low-income students to be getting up at 5 to get ready and to wait in the dark for buses during daylight savings time. Please follow the recommendation by the American Academy of Pediatrics and the Center for Disease Control and start all K through 8 schools, middle schools, and high schools no earlier than 8.30 a.m. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, Ms. Dowda? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Brandy Dada, and I am speaking to Agenda Item 3 on behalf of Callie Beans, former manager of HISD Library Services. Eliminating the Department of Library Services and the certified librarian staffing the department harms students. Every student deserves to have full access to programs that engage them in reading, such as the beloved Name That Book competition, Read Houston Read, the Astros Literacy Bus, Reading Roundup, and Real Men Read. These programs nurture an interest in reading and provide reading role models for all of our children. The Library Services Department ensures that these literacy programs are available on all our campuses, support digital resources, and adheres to research-driven best practices for literacy and libraries. Library Services is critical to the success and achievement of all campus staff and students. Restore Library Services to offer engaging literacy programs and guide our campuses on how to best serve our communities. Thank you. Ms. Marsh, Marna Marsh, yes ma'am, yes ma'am. Good evening HISD board members and Superintendent Miles. 
I'm speaking on agenda number nine. My name is Marna Marsh. As a parent deeply invested in my children's education, I'm grateful for your responsiveness to our community's concerns regarding the preservation of the dual language programs at Wharton and Helms Schools. Wharton holds a special place in my heart as has been a second home for my family for over a decade. Wharton's socioeconomic, <coughs> ethnic, racial, and linguistic diversity is a welcoming space and has allowed my three sons to thrive and become fluent in Spanish. I'm especially grateful for the friendships my children have made with kids from my diverse backgrounds. I urge you to designate Wharton as a separate and unique school. And even though this is not an easy decision, especially for our zoned families who are vital to our community, it is vital for safeguarding Wharton's exceptional program and ensuring its legacy for future generations. I encourage you to try to find a way to accommodate the zone and community families. And I urge you to expand the 80-20 dual language model to other school districts, allow more families to experience the transformative power. Thank you. Delenn Maples. Hi, my name is Delenn Maples, and I'm speaking on item four on behalf of a teacher at a non-NES school who fears retaliation. I'm a veteran teacher in HISD who has worked at some of the most challenging schools. I teach here because I believe our children are just as talented and deserving as students in other districts. This school year has been the most stressful ever due to the overall culture of fear and intimidation. I work hard to prepare my lessons and I show up daily with a smile on my face. I do it because I believe in our students. Now going into NES, my salary will be $20,000 less than a rookie teacher because I teach an elective. This is very discouraging to everyone and discriminatory. I actively recruit and contribute to a positive school culture. Electives get kids through the doors and into the seats of their core classes. It's time you recognize that elective teachers improve student outcomes. Board of managers, no trust, no bond. Remember that. Zoe McCoy. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Zoe McCoy. I am an HISD alum, an HISD parent, and the daughter of a retired HISD teacher. I'm deeply invested in this community. Um, tonight I'm speaking on behalf of Brianna Pepper, a fourth grade teacher who taught at a highly regarded non-NES school and who couldn't be here today. She says, I love teaching, but all that changed in the first week of school. On day one, I was observed four times and publicly corrected for getting to know my students and establishing class routines. On day two, my principal deemed my science journal lesson was a waste of time. <coughs> By day three, I was anxious to do the job I'd been doing well and loving for four years. I wasn't allowed to teach procedures, yet I was being reprimanded for students not following procedures. My hands were tied behind my back in my own classroom. By day four, I was hyperventilating on my way to work. Day five was my last day. I resigned after a week. Open your eyes to the talent you're losing by not appreciating and respecting teachers. Fire Mike Miles before you lose more teachers. Thank you. Ms. Riblin. I've heard great things about you as a teacher. Two of my friends met one of your former students who said that they loved your class because they got to read literature and have hilarious discussions about the characters. You clearly value joyful learning and so do I. You and I both graduated from Teachers College at Columbia University, the number one education school in the country. This is from TC's website. Teachers College was founded on the proposition that education alone can't correct our society's inequalities. We must also support poor communities' physical and nutritional health and psychological well-being. TC taught us that students' humanity is central to their learning. TC's methods are intended for poorer communities. What would your TC professor say about the NES model? Your students have joyful discussions about literature and our students deserve the same. Thank you. I think we're now at agenda speakers who have signed up to speak via Zoom. Beth Shook, please turn your camera on. You may begin. Kyle 
Del Reyes, please turn your camera on. You may begin. Is he not there? Okay, sir or ma'am, I'm not sure. We're on Kyle Race. Okay, yep, okay. Please go ahead. Sorry. Hi, my name is Kyle Racy. I'd like to communicate my support of agenda item number eight, Nate Elms Elementary, as a separate and unique school. I think it is very important that all students at this high performing school have a shared experience of dueling. I'm grateful that the board heard public comment last week and are now moving to designate Helms as a separate and unique school. However, if the Helms attendance zone is to be eliminated, I encourage the board and administration to manage the transition in a collaborative and fair way for those families currently zoned to Helms. Given that this year's school choice lottery application is already closed, it is especially important to consider neighborhood families with children that to enter Helms kindergarten this August. The grandfathering period is warranted during this transition. Parent of a child zoned to Helms, I'm excited for her to receive a rich and unique educational experience at Helms when she starts kindergarten in August. I appreciate your continued support for a strong campus-wide dual language program. Thank you. Thank you. Andrea Negri, please turn your camera on. You may begin. <coughs> Hi, my name is Andrea Negri. I'm an HISD teacher here to speak on agenda item four. I'd like to congratulate the Yates Red Lion Bots for qualifying for UIL FRC Robotics. Next year, Yates will not be eligible for a stipend because the UIL district academic competitions were also last weekend. Congratulations to Wisdom for receiving first place in touch with journalism. The Wisdom will also be NAS, which means their journalism coach will not be compensated for any weekend tournament or the extra time advising the yearbook staff. The proposed compensation manual communicates these academic pursuits only belong on them. It also puts any remaining high school the lowest in the region. Anyone predict a decline in academic extracurricular accomplishments next year? Thank you. Beth Shook, please begin. My name is Beth Shook and I'm speaking on item nine. I am a Montrose resident and an HISD alum. <coughs> My husband and I chose to move to East Montrose in part because of the zoning to Wharton. Our son is only one and a half, but we were thrilled that he would likely be able to attend a beloved neighborhood school that offers Spanish immersion. Bilingual education is a wonderful gift. I participated in one of the first dual language programs offered in HISD at Herod Elementary in the 90s. We need more of these programs. I agree with the community and the board that an English only class should not be added and that the special culture at Wharton should be preserved, but the neighborhood is part of that. If Wharton loses its zoning with no accommodations for young families like mine who plan to be a part of the Wharton community, both the neighborhood and school will suffer. I speak on behalf of several neighbors with young children when I ask that the board and Superintendent Miles please keep us in mind when considering redesignation. Thank you. Thank you. Trustee Donnie Hernandez, please turn your camera on. You may begin. Hello, Ms. Hernandez, please go Hello. ahead. Yes, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Dani Hernandez, and I am the trustee and former student teacher and administrator in HISD. And I want to thank this board for progress monitoring student outcomes because this is the most important work that the board does. I'm glad to see that the district is on track to meet goals three and four. And I encourage you to keep monitoring student groups. Um, I also want to thank the administration for putting Helm and Warren items on the agenda. Learning two languages is an invaluable skill that students will always be able to take with them even after they graduate HISD. 
my hope is that more schools will be able to have this opportunity in the future. Um, I, as a board and administrator, I, an administration, I hope that you champion, keep on championing um, early childhood education it is vital to keeping HISD goals in mind. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Wardwell, please begin. These are the words of Professor Janice Newsom, who couldn't be here. As a former elementary and secondary school librarian and the former manager of HISD Department of Library Services, I often thought of Walter Cronkite's quote, whatever the cost of our libraries, the price is cheap compared to that of an ignorant nation. School librarians are often accused of being self-serving. This stereotype has blinded this board to the perpetual harm to the most vulnerable population, our children, by limiting access to one of society's most valuable commodities, education and information. Information is doubling every 12 hours, a phenomenon that will only accelerate with time. Denying students the benefit of the place with an educator specifically trained to create a culture of reading, curiosity, and creativity prohibits their participation in technological advances and prevents their pathway to prosperity. Your single most important task is not to teach children what to think, but to teach them to think. Your 19th century model of education is backward thinking that exacerbates the high costs of an ignorant nation. No trust, no bond. Y'all forgot it's National Thank you, Library. Zone, please turn your camera on. You may begin. I don't know why my camera's not working. Can oh, it's still sorry. Okay, so there we go. Thank you. Can I may I begin now? Go ahead. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Hi, my name is Maria Benzon speaking on item 14. In 2015, after 300,000 parents in New York opted kids out of high stakes testing, laws changed. In the meantime, in Texas, it is a parent's right to opt their child out of STAR and decline tutorials like accelerated learning in summer school. Instead of standing up for STAR, we should stand up for equitable resources and meaningful curricula for all students. But what does your school get for doing well on STAR? A-rated schools don't get more money. From public testimonies, we know that even A-rated schools in HISD don't get more autonomy. From public testimony, we know that many teachers at A-rated schools are leaving H. From the leaked principal list, we know that A-rated schools are not a protection for principals in HISD. While we have an unelected school board that continues to support the uncertified superintendent, use this opportunity to boycott <coughs> STAR. For more information about opting out, visit optouttexas.net. Thank you. Jessica, could try please turn your camera on? You may begin. Allison Chapin, please turn your camera on. You may begin. <clears throat> Ms. Chapin, if you'll turn on your camera. Oh, okay. Ms. Chapin, please go ahead. I'm so sorry. Nope. Um, Ma'am, are you able to join us? If are, not, we can come back. Are you there? Yes, please go ahead. Me? We can hear you. Please go All ahead. All right. My name is Allison Chapin, and I'm a former HISD teacher. I'm speaking on behalf of a teacher who is afraid of speaking for fear of retribution. You have two goals to build a great house, but the first floor is burning. Over 30 teachers and staff have quit this year. Is That's one third of our school. Wondering why? One AP said in, in, in regards to the principal, I cannot work with that man. A viral video shows Mr. TJ Cotter humiliating students for dress code violations when he has worn Crocs and tight shirts and pants. Chuck Chirps Town High School social media. You won't know that he screams at kids and refers to our community as a ghetto. 
He wasn't on the list of principals who might lose their job. So how can you reach these goals when you have bullying, hypocritical, and inexperienced leaders being championed in HISD? The data and goals are smoke. There's a fire and you're flaming it. Please do better. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Jessica Catret, you may begin. Hi, my name is Jessica Catret. I'm a parent speaking on, on behalf of a librarian who wants to remain anonymous due to fear of retribution. Um, I'm speaking on the budget, um, the removal of librarians from the employee compensation plan and eliminating librarians from our schools will have a devastating effect on our students. Principals and non-NES schools supposedly have the discretion to keep their librarians, but non-NES schools get less funding than NES schools. Is mild punishing schools who don't sign up for the expensive and ineffective NES model by starving them financially? If a limited number of positions are funded and certain teaching positions are required, there won't be much discretion left to the principals to have a librarian. And HISD will have no more functioning school libraries. Is Miles trying to get rid of librarians so he can make room for more teen centers? For our students, please do not eliminate librarians. Instead, I suggest you eliminate Mike Miles. No trust, no bond. Michael Reeves, please begin. Um, hello, my name is Michael Reeves, and I'm the president-elect for the Texas Association of Journalism Educators. I'm also the newspaper advisor at James Bowie High School in Austin. I'm commenting today about the removal or reduction of stipends for both newspaper and yearbook advisors, as well as academic coaches and HISD. The people teaching those students should be compensated for all of the extra work they put in their programs. I strongly urge you to reconsider the cuts you are making to stipends. Yearbook and newspaper advisors, as well as UIL academic coaches, put in as much time outside of the classroom as athletic coaches, and they deserve to be compensated for that time. You want qualified and trained faculty advisors leading your publications. Without competitive stipends, they won't be coming to HISD. Thank you. Thank you. Trista Bishop-Watts, please turn your camera on. You may begin. Good evening, I'm Trista Bishop-Watt representing Houston GPS. Last summer, Houston experienced record-setting heat with temperatures regularly over 100 degrees. When our kids returned to school in August, HIT facilities were not equipped to provide the environment students needed to learn and thrive. In the first few weeks of school year, more than 1,600 HVAC issues were reported. This February, during the winter freeze, students had to learn in classrooms without fully functioning heat. This is not a new problem in HISD, but it is an escalating one, as facilities <coughs> fall for disrepair. While we know that the item on the agenda is a technical step in the bond process, we are encouraged to see the board beginning the critical conversation. In addition to HVAC issues, many of HISD's aging campuses do not meet critical safety measures like single points of entry. Some contain lead in their water and others do not have the necessary facilities to offer pre-K. HISD is nearly a decade overdue for a bond. Everything is more Thank important you, than our student health safety. Thank you. Thank you. Joe Lack, please turn your camera on. You may begin. My name is Joe Lack. I'm a retired petroleum engineer, and I'm speaking on item 12 on behalf of a teacher at a non-NES school who fears retaliation. I'm a second grade teacher with over 20 years of experience in HISD, but this year has been insufferable. Teacher evaluations have been reduced to compliance using robotic timers, limited participation to repetitive MRS strategies only, and rigid adherence to low quality PowerPoint presentations. It has created an environment of constant pressure and stress, hindering children's ability to learn and undermine their confidence as well being and well being. You should see the disappointment on my second graders' faces when they fail to finish a task before the 10 minute buzzer, and I'm not allowed to help them. It's heartbreaking. 
I make, made the decision to leave the district because I refuse to be complicit in a system that jeopardizes their education. It will stop hemorrhaging Thank you, sir. when you start. Laura Negri, please turn your camera on. You may begin. I think Ms. Negri, is that the same woman that are? I think there are two. Oh, there's two. Okay, sorry. <clears throat> Ms. Negri, please begin. Audio, and that concludes our uh, Zoom speaker to agenda items. Okay. Okay. We can come back if we need to. There's nobody else on Zoom for. Not for agenda items. Okay. Very good. Um, that concludes our hearing of speakers to agenda items. At this time, the board will recess to closed session under Chapter 551 of the Texas Government Code, Open Meetings Act, subsections 551.004 through 551.089. Should board final action, vote, or decision on any matter considered in the closed session be required, such final action, vote, or decision shall be taken at the open meeting covered by this notice upon the reconvening of this public meeting or at a subsequent public meeting of the board upon notice thereof. The board has recessed to closed session at 7.22 p.m. on April 11, 2024.
Okay, we're back. Uh, the meeting is reconvened at 8.41 p.m. We are now ready to hear and consider items discussed in closed session. Are there any motions? Uh, yes, I have a motion. Uh, here we go. My mic's on. Uh, I move that the board uh, approves the closed session personnel agenda, including specifically that the board approves proposed terminations of continuing term and probationary contracts and authorize the superintendent or designee to provide notice of, of same, that the board approves suspensions without pay for continuing term and probationary contracts and authorize the superintendent or designee to provide notice of, of same, that the board approves uh, withdrawals of contract recommendations and that the board approves issuance of final orders on contract terminations and non-renewals as discussed in the closed session effective April 11, 2024. Uh, we have a motion by Mr. Campo and a second by Ms. Lamont Flowers. Is there any discussion about this item? Okay, please vote. Oh, Adam, Mr. Ravon, can you vote by thumbs up or down or orally, please? Sorry, I didn't. Uh, I just got in. I didn't get. I didn't get to hear the motion. Oh, sorry. Okay, um, <clears throat> I'll read it. Unless you want to read it, read it. Sure. Okay, hold on. One okay, the motion, uh, uh, the board approves in the closed session personnel agenda, including specifically that the board approves proposed terminations of continuing term and probationary contracts and authorize the superintendent or designee to provide notice of same, that the board approves suspensions without pay for continuing term and probationary contracts and authorize the superintendent or designee to provide notice uh, of same, that the board approves withdrawals of contract recommendations and the board approves the issuance of final orders on contract terminations and non-renewals as discussed in the closed session effective April 11th, 2024. Okay, and we have, a, a that was uh, Rick's motion, Rick Campo's motion, and was seconded by Angie Flowers. So if you'll, I think we've all voted up here electronically, but Adam, if you want to indicate your vote. Yeah. That's a yes? Okay, thank you. <clears throat> okay, we have nine in favor, zero opposed. The motion passes. Any other motions? Uh, yes, I have one more motion. Uh, I move that the board withdraw the proposed proposal to terminate Ms. Sheena Washington's probationary contract effective April 11, 2024. I have a motion by Mr. Campo. Is our second, second by Ms. Mendoza. Is there any discussion on this item? No, okay, let's vote. <clears throat> Mr. Ravon, can you indicate your yes. vote? Yes, thank you. Uh, voting is closed, nine in favor, zero opposed. Motion passes. Um, are there any other motions? No. no. Okay. Next, we will consider action items on the agenda. Board policy requires board members to abstain from all discussion and votes pertaining to contracts that may involve a conflict of interest. Board policy BBFA local defines a conflict of interest as any circumstance that could cast doubt on a board member's ability to act with total objectivity with regard to the district's interests. We have four items held from the consent agenda for discussion. The first item is number seven, authority to establish a cooperation agreement with the Southwest University of Political Science and Law to establish a Confucius Institute. Is there a motion to approve? Is there a motion to approve? There is a motion by Mr. Campo as our second Second by Ms. Flowers. Okay, um, uh, the motion was pulled, I'm, I'm sorry, the item was pulled by several board members. Um, uh, anybody who pulled the, the uh, agenda item like to speak? 
Yes. Mr. Martinez. Sorry, I was trying to raise my hand. Uh, so, so we got some of the questions uh, on the Q&A. Um, specifically, Superintendent, um, I think we've had this program. So this is, is this a renewal? I want to make sure I'm clear about it. It's never, it just, we're just renewing it. Yes, sir. This is a program, I think, that's been going on since 2017. I'm looking at Kristen. 2016. Okay. And then the, the question I have, I think um, I want to have a better understanding as far as the staffing. From my understanding, um, previous arrangements was for some schools that had obtained grants through the program, um, they didn't necessarily feel like the teachers were prepared for this classroom, so they in fact, the, the schools decided to pay out of their own salary a staff member. Um, they still obtained grants through the, the program, but they didn't necessarily have a teacher directly from the Confucius Institute. If we approve this, are we allowing teachers to come on site directly staffed by the institute or whoever the third party may be? The, the way the grant works is that individual campuses have been able to request specific supports that align with their language programs. So um, in, in increments, they can say, for example, we want to do a cultural immersion a program on um, something related to what they're doing. So our magnet campuses typically use this, for example, when providing Mandarin instruction. Um, we've had campuses use it, for example, in our culinary programs in CTE, use it to train teachers on you know, uh, Chinese cuisine. Um, so individual campuses have been able to request what they would like to use the grant funds for. Um, there is nothing that indicates that any teacher uh, or a person from the university in China would come and be able to teach our students directly. We ensure that the students here are taught by um, our teachers who are teaching the the um, teaks in, in the U.S. Okay. And the reason I ask is because I think in the, in the agenda item it specifically says that at a later point a staffing agreement would be signed. Mm -hmm. So that's where the question comes about is whether mm -hmm. we're actually going to allow the university to staff or bring in employees on campus to HIZ. Uh, certain campuses have in the past had a student, uh, like, almost like teaching assistants, come in and support classrooms. Uh, and so they, they've had visiting teachers come in from that perspective, but that's not a requirement from the grant. It's nothing that we are required to do as a part of the agreement. Have we had any, have we had any teachers uh, in the district uh, um, staffed through the, any university, from the university? Uh, no teachers of record that I'm aware of have ever been staffed through this program. Okay, thank you. Can we have order, please? The board is trying to ask some questions about this agenda item. Um, Ms. Cruz Arnold, did you have a question or comment? Yes, I have a few questions here. Um, like Mr. Martinez, I asked a few questions in advance. Um, and my question is, uh, it, question slash comment is that the item that was provided in the agenda doesn't exactly align to what we were provided when we asked additional questions. And so I'm curious why the um, item asked for um, the authority to establish a cooperation agreement to establish a Confucius Institute, but it's later referred to as a, as a grant. Like, why is there a discrepancy there? The, the, um, the the agenda item establishes the agreement between us and the partner university. Once that agreement is in place, then grant funds can be received. So it's not, it's not the, the way that this has historically worked is that once the agreement is established, schools can access the funding. So it's referred to as a grant program because the way it has worked is grant funding has been provided to HISD historically that schools can access once the agreement's in place. And so if this is a continuation, um, why do we need a new agreement? Why don't we just have a continuation? Like, mm -hmm. Why is this coming to the board? The, the institute already exists. It's been here uh, for the previous question since 2016. The agreement, the old agreement has just expired. So this is renewal of the existing programming to support the, the many schools that use it, including our magnet programs. Um, so it is coming to the board because the old agreement expired. Um, but the program itself is in place. Schools are still actively using this funding today from the previous agreement. And is the, um, 
Asia Society grant that some schools are receiving today a part of this agreement? Um, in the first agreement, they were a part, they were one of the partners. In this agreement, they are not. It is just with a, a university uh, in, in China. That's the partner on this particular agreement. Can I please, I'm sorry, we're trying to hear from Ms. Hole and um, understand the importance of this agenda item and answers to the questions. So if, if folks could please keep their comments to themselves, it would be appreciated. Right. So are these two different, so are these two different separate programs? The um, Asia Society grant that some schools are currently receiving this school year and what we're asking for here. These are two different programs. No, they're, they're, it's the same program. Uh, the goal is the same, which is to support our campuses in being able to continue to have grant funding to provide the programming, both the cultural experience programming, but also language instruction um, at, that they're currently offering. So this is funding to continue to do the same thing. It's a renewal of the already established partnership. The difference is that the partner, the partner organization is updated. Um, it's not through the Asia Society, it's through a, the, the university. So is the current partner this campus in China for the current grant? Uh, no, it's a new partner. In the, new, in the agreement, it's a new partner organization. Who is the current partner? Um, the current partner is, uh, we've historically partnered with two partners, both College Board and um, uh, the Hanban, which is an, organ an arm of the Chinese government, their Department of Education. But that's historical. That's not this agreement. Um, just in full disclosure, my concern is that this was not all provided in advance. Because if it's confusing for people on, for me, it's confusing if you're reading it online. Thank you. Can I ask a question? I'll ask a question. So, I'm sorry, it's being described as a renewal, but it's with a different party, is that correct? Uh, the, the renewal, yes, it's a renewal of the agreement so that we can renew, the, the grant funding can continue, but the partner organization is new. Okay, and then my next question is, historically, historically, um, the funding has been for certain programs that it sounds like are funded on a on a uh, campus by campus basis, is that right? Eleven of our campuses have accessed this funding uh, once it's been made available. So Since yes. 2016? Uh, yes, 11 different okay. campuses. Mm -hmm. And then, and so do they individually, I just don't understand how it works. Do they individually request funding for a particular event or purpose and then they receive the funding? Mm -hmm. so, um, so yeah, uh, campuses can request in $10,000 increments the funds to align with the programs specific to their campus. Um, so different campuses can use it for different things. Um, there's campuses that have gotten $10,000 increments for three, four years consecutively to support uh, the, the, the language programming and cultural experiences on their campus, um, particularly our world language magnets. Um, and is there an, um, a deadline for entering into this agreement? Uh, no, the intention originally was just to ensure that campuses don't run out of the funding. Um, we have some funding remaining for this year that they're still using today, um, but not a, a hard deadline, no. Okay. Are there other questions? I have a question. The, the 11 campuses that have had access to this, <coughs> um, what, what is the, um, how, how is that determined? Like, how did these 11 campuses get access? That's a good, historically, I don't have the exact details for how it was allotted to those campuses, but I can find out for you. So, moving forward, how is it allotted? Still to the same 11 um, only? We can determine exactly how that would be allotted in the future. Our goal was to ensure that our, at the minimum, that our magnet campuses could continue with their magnet programming. Is, I'm sorry. Can you, okay, can you clarify a little bit? So, so you're wanting the same funding that was happening in the past to the same campuses? Uh, yes, we do want to just ensure the same campuses can maintain access to the funding uh, so that they can continue what they're doing, yes. Would other campuses um, 
would this be available to other campuses? Or I'm, I'm wondering about the equity about these 11. Yes, if other people it. want the money, like mm -hmm. how is it going? Like how is it getting distributed? Got it. At this point in time, we don't know the amount. So at this point in time, it's just uh, the agreement itself. Once the agreement is in place, we will be able to then determine the grant funds that we can access. Once we know the available grant funds we can access, I think we can have a better answer for you in terms of, of um, how those funds can be distributed across campuses. Okay, yes, Ms. Cruz Arnold. Um, what is the, thank you, what is the um, suggested uh, term, um, length of the term of this agreement because it's not listed here? I can follow up with you on that. I don't have that on the top of my head. Ms. Bandy. The, um, <clears throat> the first bullet on the partnership scope of work talks about uh, establishing a board of directors with the president of the university and the HISD superintendent or designee. Um, what is the purpose of this board? What are they governing? Uh, on, on our end, we would want to just ensure someone's responsible for coordinating with the partner university. So uh, um, historically, we have had, for example, um, a, a, a point person on both sides just to make sure that the two groups can stay coordinated together. So is the... Okay, so a point person. So for this particular agreement, is this a first for this establishment of the board of directors, or was there a board of directors under the current agreement or previous one? I can get back to you okay. and specifically if there was that exact actual language. And, um, and, I, and, and you may not know this, but it'd be interesting to understand who, is, who the rest of the directors are on that board as well, just for, again, just to understand what the purpose is. Um, so do you have that information or? No, I don't know. Okay. The rest of uh, um, I'm, it's, it sounds like there's some information that the yeah. board may need. Um, are you, you have another question or do you want to? I, I did have a question, but now I forgot it. I'm sorry. Um, it's all right. Um, so you said we don't know the amount of the grant funding historically. <laughs> How much have we obtained? How much Historically, have? it's been around 150000 a year. Okay. So, so it sounds like, like it really isn't about bringing in a teacher from the university versus just programming. Correct. It's not, in the scheme of things, it's not a large grant. It's really been $10,000 increments of cultural support for um, students in those particular programs and or supporting teachers and accessing resources and professional development. The grant is not a large grant. It doesn't allow us to fund significant things from the partner university. And, and then one last question. Obviously there's a concern, right? There, there, there's a general concern. Our federal government was concerned about it. There's, there's different issues. Is there any information we are providing to the university about our students, uh, detailed information, anything about our district? No, um, we did ensure that there was a legal review of the agreement and that that legal review was thorough so that we would not be violating uh, any of those types of issues. Okay, okay. so there's a, an agreement document? Yes. Okay, but it hasn't been executed yet? Correct. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm going to um, move that we table this um, until next month, if there's no deadline. Um, did somebody have a question? Oh, Adam, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Adam. It's all right. So uh, I, I, mostly of the questions uh, kind of got to the root. Um, I think it would be helpful now that we know it's about 150 that we get some clarity uh, going forward about um, the source of funding, because I'm a little bit confused about whether the university is providing the grant or the um, like the Chinese government. I'm a little confused to, about the source of funding and the way it's closed. Are there any other questions? Sorry, Adam. Anybody else? Okay. Um, should I click on this and move to... Oh. I'm going to move to table this until next month is our second it's been seconded by angie flowers 
Can we Is there any discussion on the table until the next board meeting next month or Yes, I'm okay. sorry. Next the next regular regularly board scheduled meeting. board meeting. Yes. So the motion is to table this until the next regularly scheduled board meeting and it's been seconded by Ms. Flowers. Um, is there any discussion on the motion to table? If not, then There's let's no vote. There's no discussion on the motion to table. Oh. Just vote. Well, thank you. Then let's just vote. <clears throat> Mr. Ravon, can you tell us verbally yeah. your vote? Is that a yes? Yes. Okay, thank you. That's nine in favor of tabling this agenda item number seven until next month. Um, our next agenda item is number eight, approval to designate Helms Elementary School as a separate and unique school. Is there a motion? Uh, yes, um, I move that the board approves the designation of Wharton Dual Language Academy as a separate and unique school and waives the one-year planning requirement for the impl implementation of the program so that the designation will be effective immediately and request that the superintendent provide a plan for the impl implementation of the plan for the impacted families uh, after obtaining community feedback and submit said plan to the board within 60 days. Uh, is it for Helms, the motion? Sorry. I'm sorry, Helms, not, not Wharton. Let's do it over. This is Helms? Helms. Yeah. Okay. Eight. It's not in order. Okay, uh, uh, well, let's just start over. Um, I move that the board approves the designation of Helms Elementary as a separate and unique school and waives the one-year planning requirement for the implementation of the program so the designation will be effective immediately and request that the superintendent provide a plan for implementation of the plan for the impacted families after obtaining community feedback and submit said plan to the board within 60 days. Um, motion by Mr. Campo and second by Ms. Cruz Arnold. Is there any discussion? Yes. Mr. Martinez? Just briefly, um, Superintendent, thanks for uh, committing to um, come back with feedback and engage the community. Um, it, it, this isn't an easy discussion, right? I mean, we heard two different groups, um, but the important thing is that um, we've asked the Superintendent to go ahead and, and make sure that we're engaging the community with the plan moving forward, so I appreciate that, that decision. Any other discussion? No? Okay. Let's, Adam. Yes, sir. Just yell, just yell at me. All right. Uh, the, You're not on the screen. I just want to highlight and, and caveat to uh, what Mr. Martinez stated before. Um, I've got two scheduled meetings with the community coming up uh, to discuss this issue, and I wanted to make sure that uh, both Helms and Morton get the same attention. Um, and so we're going to be out listening to the community, and, and I encourage um, uh, folks to stay involved in a uh, Thank you, Adam. Anybody else? Anybody else? Okay, great. Let us vote. <clears throat> Adam, are you a yes or a no? Yes? Thumbs up. Thank you. There are eight in favor, one opposed. The motion passes. Next item is item number nine, approval to designate Wharton Elementary School as a separate and unique school. It's like deja vu. Uh, I'm, I move that the uh, board approve that approves the designation of Wharton Dual Language Academy as a separate and unique school and waives the one-year planning requirement for the implementation of the program so that the designation will be effective immediately and request that the superintendent provide a plan for the implementation of the plan for the impacted families uh, after obtaining community feedback and, and submit said plan to the board within 60 days. Is there a second? Mr. Martinez? 
Thank you. We have a motion by Mr. Campo and a second by Mr. Martinez. Is there any discussion on this agenda item number nine? No? Okay. Please vote. <coughs> Adam. Hey, a thumbs up. Thank you. <coughs> motion passes. Eight in favor, one opposed. Okay. We're now moving to our consent agenda. Do I have a motion to approve tonight's consent agenda by consensus? I have a motion by Mr. Martinez and a second by Ms. Mendoza. Is there any discussion about the consent agenda items? Okay, please vote on the consent agenda. Adam, yes, Adam, okay, good, thank you. Okay, the nine in favor of the consent agenda, none opposed, so the um, uh, consensus passes. Um, we are now ready to consider two discussion and report items. We'll begin with constraint two progress measures 2.1 and 2.2. Mr. Superintendent, you have the floor on the monitoring report. Chief Stacy Vinson will uh, guide us through the progress monitoring report. Good evening, Board of Managers. I'm happy to report with you um, today on constraint number two. The superintendent shall not allow ineffective supports, systems, and processes for students receiving special education services across the <coughs> district to negatively impact individual education plan development <coughs> and implementation. Um, the constraint progress measure that we're looking at that feeds into that constraint goal <coughs> is the district will increase the percentage of initial eligibility ARD committee meetings conducted <coughs> in compliance with federally required timelines from 87% in June 2023 to 100% in June 2024 and maintain that 100% compliance through June 2028. And so um, just to kind of bring context to you, um, at last October, um, the superintendent and I uh, reported to you all that in the year 2022-23, the district had missed 515 initial ARD timelines, um, which allowed, did not allow our students to access the services they needed in a timely fashion. So currently, we're at 99.5% um, of initial our time lines being held on time with uh, nine um, missed our timelines. Out of those nine missed our timelines, three of those um, were to really work with parents to schedule with them um, to ensure that they were able to attend um, their students' first initial ARD meeting. And so um, this is great progress um, from last year. And um, the team has worked really hard um, along with um, the superintendent guiding us as that, you know, with the new organizational structure of special education being, um, imp or being embedded into the division team unit, that really allows the team to not only um, you know, we're not just special education out on our own. We're really working collaboratively within the unit division teams and our um, division superintendents and executive directors to make sure that our families are, um, get, are get accessing the services as required by law. 
Um, the next item, and I'm sorry, this is not Audrey. May I ask a question? Technology, because it's not moving. Okay. okay. Yes. It's not moving. Go to the next one, please. Okay. All right. Um, and we'll continue with cr uh, constraint number two, um, looking at constraint progress measure 2.2, which is the percentage of IEPs reviewed by the independent team of special education of the special education department for compliance and delivery of services will increase from 7% in January 2024 to 20% in June of 2028. So in order to obtain a baseline of IEP compliance and delivery of services, the Office of Special Education team conducted the largest randomized folder review across the district. This is the first time a review of this scale has been completed. So the OSCS team, Office of Special Education team, developed a targeted review um, system, and then we had to train our central office team to, um, on the system and ensure calibration to ensure consistency as we looked um, through at the campuses. Um, campuses campus principals then received an actual folder review summary. This again was another first for our campus principals to actually get a um, visual of feedback and areas that they could focus on. That summary, um, the special education team met with their campus principals and went over that summary with them and they identified uh, three focus areas for their next steps depending on what the campus need was and the results of that summary. Um, and those next steps included um, professional development as well as how the campuses would monitor and track um, their, these specific areas along with technical resources to help them um, meet these um, indicators. This um, activity triggered rich and productive conversation on ways that campuses can really improve in um, the implementation of special education services and was productive conversation with the campus principals because they all, we all want to do well and we all want to serve our students um, in that capacity. This baseline data is being used, of course, to um, really drive our professional development as we move forward, and then um, to look at our processes and procedures so that we can ensure that our students are receiving their services. That concludes my um, presentation on the constraints. Yes, I have a question. So a, a couple of questions. One um, is when the meetings are held with the parents, are they, if, if they, the parent speaks only Spanish, is there someone that speaks to them in their language, whether it's Spanish or any other language, so that they're understanding the, the report that they're receiving? Um, yes, so in the actual ARD meetings, because these yes. reports went to principals yes. just to give them an overview of how yeah. they're doing on the campus, but when, um, when, uh, families are set of sec have second languages, then we also contract out to ensure that there is someone in the ARD meetings to um, help translate. Is that timely? I know when you contract out sometimes for different languages, yeah, it's, they, it's We've had very good okay. um, response okay. rate with our contractors. Good. The, the second question I had is the Office of Special Education Services, that's internal? That's our central office. Okay. And so um, I know um, we talk a lot about our division teams because we have pushed out our central office staff into the divisions mm -hmm. and so that they really um, have that, f um, can really um, support that feeder pattern of schools that they're assigned to. And so, yes, it's centrally, but it's also like in the divisions. 
And my last question would be is, do we have something online or somewhere where these parents, they may be new to this program, where they can go online and learn more about what it is the art is or what they need to be involved in or how they can be part of the process? Yeah, so um, we are working on uh, producing that um, as that is an area of need um, that we identify. We're, um, we are having our special education parent summits. Last week, uh, we had our central. Um, this On the 20th, we will have um, our west and south division. And on the 27th, we will have our north division summit. And that's new because in previous years, they had one summit and I believe it was held here at Hattie Mae White, and people had to drive in from their community. So this year we're pushing that out into the community, hoping that we can get um, <coughs> that we can reach more p families. When we do when we do get there and have that information, it's just remember to do it in the different languages. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Are there are there virtual options for the summit? Not at this time. We, the board needs to be able to ask questions, and I appreciate that folks might have some opinions or ideas, um, but we need to be asking a question and getting an answer, and it's hard to hear up here when there's um, statements that are made in response to particular questions that are being asked. So, um, sorry, can you please go ahead with your question again? Mm -hmm. I asked if there was a, a virtual option. Is there a reason why we don't have one? Um, we just haven't went that route yet, but that was a discussion after our central um, summit because we know that that's easier for parents. So some of the discussion that we took back from that is hosting um, a lunch and learn because with the, um, and having a virtual type of option, especially for our student, our parents who have newly identified students. So that is something that we're actually looking at expanding as we move forward. Mm -hmm. And can I have, a, I have a question about the review? So we're gonna increase um, the review. At, at the, do you foresee it happening in the same way next year as this year? Because um, you've gone through this once and I'm just wondering about how long it took or um, it, it, do you, what you foresee this looking like next year, especially as you expand it. Um, this first time was, uh, it took longer than what we wanted. Of course, there were a lot of training components because we had to calibrate internally in order to produce for our principals a quality report. Mm -hmm. And so um, longer than expected, but now that we have done it once, we'll be doing it again in May um, because we wanna give, um, now that our um, teams have supported those campuses with training training and support, then we're going to do another randomized audit in May um, and give them the same type of review and we're hoping that it doesn't take as long now that we have all calibrated on the method. As we move forward, we also know that um, long term we want to build capacity within our campuses so that central staff isn't always the person that is reviewing these items and so i think next year um now that i the staff has been trained and uh, maybe even conducting those reviews on site elbow to elbow with principals department chairs so that they can really sit and learn the process and really <coughs> you know, develop their capacity as we move forward. Well, I know this was a mammoth task, so we appreciate all the hard work that went into creating the system so that we can continue this, so thank you. Thank you. I have a question. Um, what, so what is the cadence that's expected? You're, you said you're gonna do it again in May. Is the expectation so, to do it again in yes, fall? Yes, in the fall and then another spring. Okay, so twice a year? Yes. Got it. Ms. Ozan Bandy. I have a question. Thank you for the information. Um, I, I kind of want to take a step back just for informational purposes. Can you explain what is included in a, re, in a folder? Like what contents, reports, what's in a folder? So uh, this was a targeted folder review. Okay. And so um, we pulled specific items really related to some of the things that are in our exit criteria for mm -hmm. us to meet. Mm -hmm. 
um, to look at, like duly constituted ARDS, are our parents getting their notice, are their present levels of performance up to date with quality IEPs. Mm. Those were like the main components because we have to start somewhere. Okay. This is a, a massive task, mm -hmm. however, we have to target, begin somewhere mm -hmm. to, to make traction. Mm -hmm. And so we pulled those er specific areas um, to really help us to move the needle. Mm -hmm. And, and I, we all feel like those are the main areas to help our students because I'm about to talk about a growth progress measure that is about implementation of the IEP. And so mm -hmm. for, um, for our folders not to have, um, or you know, not have the adequate IEPs for our students, then we know that they're, they won't be able to make the progress they need. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you for that. And just one follow-up question. Were there, were there any um, persistent or recurring areas of need that, that were found? Like, um, and again, I understand this informs some of the professional development, which is great, so that we can close the gaps. But what were the persistent or reoccurring areas of need? Um, the strengths really were um, in the time, holding ARDS in a timely um, manner, that annual meeting, that annual timeline, um, the ARD committee participation, having all members there and um, in the ARD committee. Um, the areas that we're really progressing in is um, the IEP uh, development of IEPs and really reviewing our data to get that student's present level of academic and functional performance and ensuring that information is documented in that ARD, um, which goes into that implementation of the IEP. Any other questions? Yes. One Ms. question. Yes. With regard to the IEPs, is there a checklist that's provided to ensure that, it, I mean, that every auditor is looking at the same thing? Yes. So the targeted review um, consisted of the same questions across the board. And so that's why we all calibrated and trained on that uh, prior to, you know, um, we had to do that centrally before we can push that out to the campuses. Um, the one thing I would recommend to what Ms. Mendoza said is um, anything dealing with special education, put it on a website so people understand what it exactly we're looking at, so the IP checklist. Um, and then a question about the summit. Um, how was it, was it well attended and how are we communicating with parents about the summit? So um, it was, um, we ha only had about 35 parents. Um, however, there were a lot of vendors there. There were probably that many vendors um, that were ready, prepared to give our parents information. And um, and so that's part of the summit. They ha would go to it, and it'll be the schedule moving forward in the others that um, there's a welcome, there's sessions on specific topics, and then in between the breakout sessions, then you can go visit with the vendors, and afterwards there's time with the vendors and raffles and fun things, and we had dance teams and things there um, for um, our families. So it wasn't very well attended. However, I'll go back to this is the first time we pushed it out to the community. We have, and historically, we have held it here at Hattie Mae White. And so I think that change may also um, <coughs> be an impact. And then we're working with communications to, um, we did some call, recorded call outs. We did the flyers home. Principals put things on, some principals <coughs> put things on the marquees. And I know um, that Dr. Martinez <coughs> and her team were um, pushing that information out to principals as well. Any other questions? Governance centric? Mr. Ravon? Yeah, so congratulations. I think it's uh, worth noting that uh, the progress that you made is, is um, pretty amazing. So I appreciate the hard work that you put in already. And at the same time, I look forward to seeing when we have 100% compliant. Um, so I encourage you all to continue to, to push forward. Um, at the same, uh, and then on another note, I would uh, 
you know, half of our parents are single single parents in the district. So half of the students in the district have single parents that they go home to. Um, and I'm wondering what and how important it is to get uh, both parents engaged in the process and what um, activities you've taken, what steps you've taken to engage all parties in, in relationship to that. So um, as far, I think, it, I'm, I think it's twofold. Um, I think as far as a district, like a parent summit or training, I definitely know that we can expand in that area and really work on offering some <laughs> online opportunities and things like that. Um, also, I know um, as far as participation at schools, um, one of the things that we've really um, uh, targeted this year is really looking back at our operate, special education operating procedures because our operating procedures say that parents should be notified 10 days, which is beyond what the federal uh, requirement is. The federal requirement is five days. But as a district, we're giving our parents 10 days notice prior to having um, any ARD meetings. And so going really honing in with our staff that that is our local, um, our local operating procedure and knowing that we're now moving towards that, that should allow parents to be more, more engaged or have ample time um, for to attend their ARD committee or their ARD students' <coughs> ARDs if um, you know they want to participate. Okay. Any other government? Yes, sir. And so, in the files, when you do the review, um, and and I don't need the details, but. Um, I assume that, that there's a way to determine whether both parents' names and contact information are in the file. Uh, my concern is, and, and what I'm hearing, is that um, only one parent is getting a notice or that, uh, you know, that they never get a notice at all uh, regarding uh, the, particular, uh, the particular R meeting. Okay, I understand your question. When um, there's two, because there's two parents that aren't living in the household, to ensure that their both parents receive the the notice. Yes. Uh, yes, sir. I will follow up on that to ensure that in those cases where we're allowed to do that communication, that we are, we do that. Okay. Are there any? Uh, other questions that are not tactical in nature that are governance focused. Go ahead. And let me try, and you can you can tell me. <laughs> <laughs> Don't ask the question. Um, I, I wanted to know about um, about the ARDS and if everyone has access to virtual ARDS or is it campus by campus? Yes, um, we do <clears throat> offer a virtual option for ARD to for all families. Yes. Thanks. That's anybody else with um, the progress of IEPs, how are we measuring the actual progress, the implementation of the IEP that we're actually doing what we're committing to doing with the parents? And so part of that folder summary looked at was their progress monitoring co completed in that folder. So it was part of the folder summary. However, um, our procedure outside of just the folder review where they received um, their campus information, then um, our, <coughs> our, our parents received their progress reports in alignment with the, with the report card. Um, so they should be receiving their IEP progress report in alignment with the report card. And so we do look at the reporting to see if that has been completed by the campus. Okay, thank you for all the information and your hard work. Um, is there a motion to accept the constraint monitoring update okay. presentation of constraint two progress measures 2.1 and 2.2? There's a motion by Mr. Martinez and a second by Ms. Mendoza. Um, please vote. Oh, sorry, you have to hit my computer to get it back. <clears throat> uh, 
Adam, are you a yes or no? Yes. Yes. Nine in favor, zero opposed. All right, the motion passes. Okay, now we will hear on um, a presentation on goal three, progress measure 3.1, and goal four, progress measure 4.3. Mr. Superintendent. <coughs> or Ms. Hull. Thank you. Let me get this back active for you one minute. Thank you all. So uh, goal three, uh, just to take a step back, is really looking at both TSI readiness for students and those students being, uh, being able to obtain their IBC by the time that they graduate. So progress measure 3.1 is just looking at the first part of the overall goal, which is really around TSI readiness in 11th grade. Um, one of the things, TSI readiness, we're really looking at a set of assessments. We're looking at the SAT, the ACT, and the TSIA, which is basically Texas's version of the SAT. Um, and students must hit a threshold on, on one of those assessments in reading and math. Um, and so we really monitor their ability to do that starting in 11th grade so that we can ensure we're supporting most students in that through 12th grade. And the, the figure two shows um, the goal that we have to hit overall. So really looking at our 20, uh, 23 grads hitting 12% uh, at the end of that graduation year. Um, but when we're looking at status to date, one of the things that you can observe in the data is that there's a really big jump from middle of the year to end of year data. You can see this in the 22, 23 data. The main reason for that is because as a district, we provide a district-wide SAT in the spring. So when you're looking at the middle of the year data, it won't account for the fact that all of our students haven't sat for the SAT yet, uh, which is one of the ways that many students obtain T the TSI threshold. Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why you see the big jump from the middle of the year data to the end of year. But when comparing middle of the year last year to, end to middle of the year this year, um, we still have seen a slight increase, which shows that we're on track to hit our broader target. Uh, we also, on the next slide, just we pay close attention to the subpopulations. And so when we looked at this more closely by subpopulation, we did see an increase for our economically disadvantaged students and our Hispanic students. Um, for African American students, the percentage stayed the same. And we saw a slight decrease um, for emergent bilingual students and for students with, uh, with um, disabilities. But again, this is a lower end count than what we would typically see by the end of the year. So we're uh, really waiting on this, uh, the SAT results data so that we can analyze by subpopulation again to see where our 11th graders end up so that we can ensure there's a much more targeted support plan based on the results of that information. Um, and so really just ensuring both participation uh, and results for all of our subpopulations continue to improve. Uh, and want to call attention to a little bit more data that we track. At the top left, you'll look at some of the participation data. What you really see here is there's been a bump in that TSIA test, so that, that Texas version of the SAT test. That's happening at this point in time because we're pretty strategic with that test for students. Um, it, it relates to ensuring that they have access to dual credit. And so students have to be eligible for dual credit. They don't have to take one of these tests to be eligible. It's not the only option. They can also be eligible through their end of course exams, through PSAT, through a couple of other things. But they can take the TSIA to help them access dual credit. And so that's why um, we've been really thoughtful about trying to increase access to dual credit. And you can see that in the bump for the TSIA participation in figure four. Um, but again, we'll, we'll, we're, we're anticipating participation overall increase much more by the end of the year just because of that, uh, the district-wide SAT and that targeted TSIA support for students over time. Um, and then in figure five, you see the results for reading and math. Uh, this shows that our reading scores have improved from middle of year last year to middle of the year, this year. That again, I think is a result of the continued focus on high quality instruction for reading and curriculum and, and our reading courses. Um, and in math, you see a decrease, but one of the things that we know is true is 
when students have taken the TSI tests at this point in time in 11th grade, they have not yet completed Algebra 2. And when you're taking these tests, it covers content that you would learn in Algebra 2. So um, by the time they take the SAT, they're much further along in their Algebra 2 course, which means they've covered a lot more of the content that would help prepare them to meet the threshold on these assessments. Um, so that's one of the things we, we typically see in the data for math in particular. Uh, and then lastly, I just wanted to step back and talk about some of the broader actions that we have put in place to make sure that we can support students in becoming TSI ready. Uh, so one of the things that we continue to come back to is across all of our courses, ensuring that students have access to both high quality curriculum that supports grade level instruction in our coursework and then the high quality instruction of that curriculum in classrooms. For this year, we've provided that curriculum for ninth and 10th grade courses. So geometry, algebra one, English one, and English two. Um, but based on feedback from many teachers and many principals, we're planning to add to that offering for next year. Um, so we'll write curriculum for uh, algebra two as well, for English three as well, um, and then also for um, what we call ESOL, which is English for speakers of other languages to support stronger resources for teachers teaching those courses, which then should in turn continue to help support TSI readiness on these assessments. Um, so that's just some of the things from a curriculum and instruction perspective we're enhancing and improving. Um, we also have a lot of support around the preparation for these assessments. Um, and so we support all high school students in accessing Khan Academy, which is the, the College Board official, uh, officially sponsored test preparation for the SAT. So we support our students in accessing that as they prepare. Um, we offer many, many Saturday boot camp sessions that all of our students can access to, for free to support them in the preparation they need to sit for the exams. Um, and then um, we also are working to make sure that all of our, um, our campuses are trained on ensuring they're requesting the appropriate accommodations for the students in these tests. Um, so the students or students with disabilities can request accommodations on the SAT, the ACT, and the TSIA. So we're working with them to, making, to make sure that they can do that uh, so that they can you know, uh, approach the test with, with the best supports possible for, for those learners. Um, and then lastly, uh, just calling out for the EB students, our emergent bilingual students in particular, um, there's a couple of things we've continued to do. Um, we have very targeted professional learning for our teachers and our campuses that support emergent bilingual students that really help uh, support them in accessing content and writing in, in, uh, in English so that they can do well on the assessments. Um, and then we also support campuses in having specific data profiles for each of our EB students that they can use to have conversations with all the students themselves to help support them in, in improving over time. So we do a lot of very specific supports for emergent bilinguals to help ensure that they're prepared. Um, and then th the final piece to that is we're really working to support uh, summer school for our emergent bilingual population for students in high school, specifically so that we can help ensure they're prepared uh, to sit for TSI readiness for this year. So a lot of specific supports for emergent bilingual students so we can maintain focus on the different subpopulations uh, in preparation for TSI. Um, and then the last thing, this progress measure really does focus on 11th grade, but if students are not TSI ready by the time they complete our 11th grade, we still want to continue to support them in 12th grade and becoming TSI ready. So we don't want to lose that um, as we look at this metric. Uh, we, uh, one thing for example is we noticed there were numerous students in previous years that were super close to that threshold. They were very close to the TSI threshold and if they were just a little bit further they would have met that. Um, and that can be incredibly impactful for those students, particularly the ones that are moving on uh, to college who then, if they, if they don't hit the threshold, have to go take additional remediation courses that cost them money. Um, and in many instances, the data shows leads to drop out. So we're still really maintaining a focus in 12th grade for students who are not yet meeting that threshold. So we could support them in, um, in doing that while they're in high school to again, prevent that remedial work uh, in, the, in the college transition. Uh, so that's an overall summary of just some of the key actions related to ensuring we are supporting kids in being TSI ready, but happy to take questions. I, I'll start. Um, you mentioned um, in talking about, um, I think, 3.1, that um, we are writing curriculum for Algebra 2, English 3, and ESOL. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, can, can you explain 
how that how that is um, an improvement for our students over what they're currently utilized like if, is there a curriculum that's currently being utilized in those courses that is not approved by the state or for some other reason not sufficient um, right right now uh, campuses have had autonomy and and they decide what to use but there's not a set resource that's provided in those courses so this is an enhancement because it gives all teachers access to something that we know will be high quality and is it a requirement across all campuses or is that it's not required for we're, we're uh, making it available next year for the first time and it's not required it's optional And are there, um, I guess, um, I assume we've done some assessment on what's currently being used as far as curriculum and it's not sufficient. Uh, so, so different campuses use different things. There are, um, there are some campuses that use some of our approved vendors and, and so that would be good. Um, but for the campuses that are not, we do wanna ensure that they have an available resource. Okay. Any other questions? Can you just give us a little, just because we're hearing it for the first time, a little bit more information um, about that? And when you when you say it's made available, is that going to be the principal's choice? Can you just kind of yeah. flesh that out for us? And um, when we when we say made available, we post all of our our NES and or our district provided curriculum on Canvas, and so any campus leader or any teacher can access that curriculum uh, via just our, our platform on Canvas. So we will make it freely available on campus, on campus for all of our teachers. Um, and, and then you know, we'll um, allow the, the principals to work with their teachers to determine if it's a resource that they wanna use in their, in their classroom. Thank you. I'm sorry, I'm coming back to the same thing. Um, so, um, have we done an assessment though of like what they're currently using to to know that there's some below standard curriculum that's being utilized or that there is not already one that's available because if we're writing curriculum we're expending resources and doing that if there's something that's already been approved and available then I wonder why would we expend resources on that if it's already there um we uh some of our campuses we do know have used the approved resource Carnegie Learning, which is the approved secondary math resource, mm -hmm. for example. Um, but we, um, many campuses kind of have not, you know, still do their own thing and have, you know, either found resources or created their own thing. So this is just providing them with an option that we know is vetted and high quality. Um, in our non-NES campuses, they have options to choose between the NES curriculum and uh, another a set of other vendors and so for um, it, it, those are examples of situations where we do want to make sure they have some choice so again this is it's kind of like offering <coughs> NES but just in a couple of additional courses and again they can still have access to Carnegie if for example that was what they were using before and if that's working for them I, I'm not you want to you talk about the the three or four that were allowing them to choose if they don't have it and will pay for it? Yes, we can do that. So um, for, for our non-NES campuses, we have uh, a list of approved products. We look for at least three in all of our uh, subject areas and grade bands, and we support them in saying, if you choose one of these three that we know are vetted, um, we can fund that centrally for you from, as a district. So, um, for example, in, uh, in uh, you know, elementary, kindergarten through fifth grade reading, they'll have three options. They can use the NES option or they can use two additional approved options if they're not NES so that they have flexibility and choice while also ensuring that different options that we provide are vetted by us and the state. And, and also as part of the defined autonomy um, concept, uh, which will start doing next fall to assess the schools, one of the things we'll be assessing is their curriculum. Uh, we're still gonna give wide latitude to the A and B schools. That's part of the autonomous nature that you know was inherited. But for the, for the C-rated schools, for example, they have to choose one of the vetted curriculum, either from TEA 
or the NES program, Amplify, Eureka, Carnegie. Um, and so we'll, we'll have a better feel for each school, but again, um, you know, we want to allow autonomy uh, in a defined way. And if you're, if you're already, you know, if you're an A or B campus, then you get to choose the curriculum you want to use. I also can clarify, we're not paying for anything new by providing this. Oftentimes what we do is we'll take the approved underlying resource and we build the additional resources that we know are supportive in helping teachers teach the curriculum. So we'll build the, we can build the slide decks and the DOLs um, and those additional supports that um, they use in their classroom. So again, we're not purchasing anything new to do this. We're able to use the underlying resources that we already have access to um, while just building the additional materials for teachers in those courses. And so you're saying you would use the Carnegie curriculum, but you just add additional right. so supports, for example, documents, whatever it is. Right. So for example, with Carnegie, what a teacher gets is a, is a teacher guide. Um, and it's you know a thick binder and it has the lesson plans in it that they can look at But it doesn't have for example anything they can use to facilitate the discussion with the teacher via slides so we we will um, Ensure that in these courses we can use our underlying resources that we already have available through us through existing district licenses um, And or through TEA's open education resources, which means freely available licenses um, and we can use that to build the resources that can be additional supports for teachers in those courses. So, so I'm clear. So when you're talking about writing curriculum for Algebra 2, English 3, and ESOL, you're talking about using existing platforms, for lack of a better word, but adding to that, rather than creating a whole new curriculum. Right. Okay. We, we use existing resources, and then we build the specific things that we know okay. our teachers are helpful for our teachers when they're working on that course. Understood. Thank you. Yes. Thank you for the clarification. Not for ESOL. Okay. About the TSI um, TSI assessment, so you talked about um, about the different resources we have, like Khan Academy or these Saturday supports for for the standardized testing. Um, have you given thought to, or is there a plan about standardizing access and communications around that? Because um, because we have resources, but the teenagers or parents don't know about it. We don't have resources, and and. That information um, is varied from campus to campus. Um, are we doing anything about building it on our website or someplace else so that it's, you know, so the district knows the information is getting to the students? Uh, yes, uh, thank you. And um, yes, I think we're doing two things that I think are important. One thing with all of our platforms, we actually are trying to ensure we have ways to even see what the usage is. So that anytime we have access to any sort of digital tool like Khan, we actually know our students using it and is it working. And so the first thing we actually do is try to make sure we have the right data structures and systems in place to know that the, the, the um, materials and or the resources that we're using are actively being used. But I think to your point, yes, in addition to that, one of the things we've done a lot of work on is making sure that all of our, uh, we have the right dashboards that show what students need it most, and we directly support our divisions in accessing those so they can provide direct supports to the specific students to let them know that those resources are available. So for example, let's take TSI readiness. Um, we have dashboards that show, hey, these specific sets of kids are right on that threshold, especially in 12th grade for meeting TSI. We need to make sure our principals and our division leadership are directly supporting these subset of students for additional re remediation so that they can take um, the TSI assessment again, especially because they're so close. Um, so we're really, we use a lot of data to be really targeted in how we support specific student groups so that they can, so that one, we're not over testing when we know they're not ready, but, but when they're close, we can ensure that they have that additional remediation and that, that additional support so that they can test again and be ready. So for, for um, the TSIA, for example, um, it, uh, prior it was kind of done on an ad hoc basis where this year we, we had four specific testing windows for the TSIA that we could communicate to schools, to families, to parents. And that gave us a very targeted date for which each kid could prepare to take that assessment. Um, so that's just a difference in strategy, I think, even in the TSIA itself, which is very, you know, four systematic windows. 
where we could support specific kids in taking that test right when they were ready based on that targeted remediation that they were receiving. Thank you. Ms. Slender. Thank you. The, um, the action plan, the action steps are, are very detailed, but one thing I couldn't tell, if you could please explain, what are we providing as far as additional supports before 11th grade? Are we providing anything 9th, 10th, or so when they show up in 11th, they're better prepared for success in, um, on, these, on the TSI? Mm -hmm. And I think the primary thing we do still focus on there is that access to, to high quality grade level instruction in those grades. The critical, and, and in the previous grades prior to that, um, there's a lot of research that again continues to show providing students to that tier one grade level instruction is critically important and we wanna be doing that in ninth grade and 10th grade. We know that we'll continue to prepare students for Im improved scores on the TSI. Yeah, and I, I would add that's exactly the answer. But uh, on top of that, for example, in the NES orbit, uh, we double block English 1, English 2, and Algebra 1 uh, so that kids have more time and more uh, differentiated instruction. Ms. Bandy? Yes, oh, let's let Cassandra go ahead and then Mr. Ravon. Thank you for the information. Um, as it relates to the e math scores kind of being flat or declining, um, and it looks like the explanation is around when students are taking Algebra two. So I know some students who, I guess, um, are excelling may take it in 10th grade, but most take it in 11th grade. So is the expectation that we should always see math being flat or declining? Um, because, or how are we gonna solve for that? Um, I think it's really important to make sure we look at math at the end of the year because the students that are taking this test are, um, uh, it's not the primary time at which we're looking at supporting them and achieving TSI. So again, for example, it might be a subset of students who took it because we wanted to ensure they could access dual credit. So it, it's not, hey, all of our students in math, or all of our students are taking it uh, at this time, it's just different populations of students that are taking it for different reasons. And so really prior to the spring of 11th grade, we're supporting just great quality grade level instruction on the courses we know will be covered in the assessments themselves. So I do think whenever we're looking at the end of year scores, if math drops in that way, we should pay a lot of attention to it so that we can then determine what and why is that happening. But um, but the people who take it now, it's it's a, a spattering of people for different reasons. Uh, so, any other questions, comments? Adam, sorry. Yep. Adam, you um, got to come back. So, yes. <laughs> I'm not on mute, Emma. No, no, I was kidding. Go okay. ahead. Oh, okay. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I meant come to Houston and sit with us. Yeah. Um, so next, we uh, the thing that I just wanted to pull out. So on figure, oh, two things. One, I'm not sure how the monitoring calendar works out for for this measure going forward, but it sounds like it's really important that we get something after, um, you know, the SATs and, and things like that are taken. Um, so I, I'd encourage us to take a look at the calendar to just make sure that. We're, we're able to review those at a later date as well. In, in addition to that, I just wanted to clarify, so figure three is primarily then SAT and seemingly primarily SAT, correct? Yeah, I'm gonna move to this slide really quick. On figure four, you see assessment participation. Um, so here is where you actually see that of the three tests, SAT, ACT, and TSIA, and um, we saw significant increase in the TSIA test. So that's where we see larger percentage of students participating. Um, so then if we go back to where you're asking about uh, participation in figure three, um, we are seeing increases in participation, but that's uh, likely primarily driven by the TSIA, not the SAT, because that's where we saw the bump. Got it, and so primarily for the look like Asian students were getting a high hair bump. And I'm, I'm just thinking about like, what is this story telling us and why? 
um, and whether you've been able to garner any insights on why participation in different groups are at differing levels uh, and what we can do to um, bring awareness and, and, and more uh, participation in that. Yeah, and I, I think some of the hypothesis is, um, is, again, it often is given at this point in time when we're trying to support students being able to access dual credit, and so you might have higher percentages of those populations really supported in that way or needing to take the test for that reason. Um, so not all uh, students necessarily are, are eligible for dual credit, but this is one way in which more students can become eligible. Got it. I have a question. Yes, sir. So to follow up, so how do we, so what is the plan to increase participation uh, in other subpopulations? In dual credit? Yes. Uh -huh. Uh, we do have a different progress monitoring measure on dual credit, but one of the things we do for that particular area, and again, again I, I can answer this, but you guys tell me if you don't want to move into that because that's not necessarily focused on this, but we do actively monitor what students have that potential to be able to access dual credit, and when they do, we work really hard to make sure they meet the eligibility criteria. So we can monitor the students that say, hey, you are potentially eligible. We want to make sure that you meet one of the eligibility criteria. It could be TSIA, or it could be something else that they've already done, their PSAT, their end of course exams, a number of other things too. And you mentioned earlier um, that for students who are like right there uh, being TSI ready, um, there's additional supports. Can you explain what that support system looked like for them mm -hmm. uh, and making sure that they kind of cross the threshold? Yeah, there's a number of things. So one of the things we do, and this, this is one of our um, strategies particularly that we put in place for 12th graders, um, but one of the things we do is there's a, a, there's a program called Texas College Bridge. It's funded by TEA, and it's a remediation course that we can pair with students taking Algebra 2 and or English 3. So while they're in those two courses, they take this additional remediation course that can help further prepare them for TSI. Um, so they get that additional support. Um, again, uh, that's one thing. We, do, we did place more focus on ensuring students had access to the Khan Academy preparation support before they took it. Um, one of the things we're doing for that resource in particular is ensuring we can actively monitor the usage and effectiveness of that resource, which hadn't been previously done. Um, and then we also have been offering numerous Saturday boot camps. So as we identify the students who we know might test, again, in one of those TSIA windows that we're offering, we do want to make sure we're supporting them and being ready. And if they do need that even additional support outside of the remedial coursework that they're already getting, um, and outside of the Khan Academy supports, they can also attend those sessions. Um, and so we staff those over the Saturdays to support those kids. Okay, thank you very much. Are we ready to move on to 4.3? Yes, let's do it. Okay. Thank you very much, Ms. Hall. So now we're going to move on to goal four, which is students in grades four through eight who receive special education services that achieve growth as measured in domain two, part A of the state accountability system will increase from 63% in August of 2023 to 78% in August 2028. And the goal progress measure that informs that goal is the percentage of students in grades three through eight who receive special education services who are projected at meets grade level in reading and math on NWEA map will increase from 11% in September 2023 to 26% in May of 2028. So I want to take you to figure six, which actually shows the percent of students with disabilities who are achieving at grade level at the middle of the year report. As a district, we have high expectations for all of our students and know our students with disabilities qualify for special education services based on a disability category and an educational need. 
Historically, our students with, dis, um, students with disabilities show higher gains in the growth category of STAR versus the meets category of STAR. And so you will see in figure seven, the figure below shows the percent of students with disabilities who achieved growth at the end of last year for the 22-23 year. So it's very two distinct measures. One is showing meets grade level proficiency and one is showing growth. And so um, next month I'll be back reporting on another goal progress measure which is focused more on the growth metric but tonight we are specifically talking about students with disability who meet the grade level proficiency. So the next chart you will see um, again, at our middle of the year, our assessment data reveals that 12% 12 of our students with disabilities are on the path to achieving grade level proficiency. Um, this 12% also reflects the end of year target um, for these students. And so you'll also see that in this data that six out of the eight um, targets have been achieved at middle of the year. Um, the two areas where we did not achieve those uh, targets are with the um, economically disadvantaged and our um, white population, which brings me down to figure eight, which you will see this is the number um, you'll see a percentage, but I also want to bring um, your attention to the number of students in these um, groups. As you can see, the Asian group um, is a smaller number as well as white students um, with students with disabilities. Um, you'll also want to bring attention to the ec economically disadvantaged um, because you'll see that in reading they actually um, met our middle of the year target and um, in math is the area that they stayed at the target er, at that rate and so we still need to have we still have an area of growth in that area <coughs> sorry um, and then it goes into of course just what are the root causes as to why our students are um, not are our students are at this low proficiency level in reading and math. And so reviewing the data and um, looking at really aligns with what Chief Ho presented last week. Um, although our students with disabilities receive special education services, they are general education students first, which means they need a strong tier one high quality instruction and so again as we continue to provide training and resources to our teachers to really increase their ability to um, provide that tier one high quality instruction along with the um, curriculum guidelines for those high quality instructional materials but tonight I really want to talk to you about area three, which is specially designed instruction, and that is the meat of special education. In order, um, as you, a student qualifies for special education, then part of the process in that ARD committee is that we review data, like the um, data from the NWEA, and look at where, how students are performing and identify those areas of need to design that individualized education program, which then refers to specially designed instruction. And so we're really focusing on providing our teachers and administrators on what is specially designed instruction versus tier one instruction. <laughs> And uh, what does that look like in the classroom? And so we're really, um, that has been our focus um, as we're moving on to really ensure that our students are progressing and that they have the um, services that they need. Um, figure nine is again the same type of uh, data, but it shows um, our students with disabilities um, in comparison with students without disabilities in both reading and math and math and reading. 
And so um, the million dollar question is always, how are you going to uh, close that achievement gap um, between our general education counterparts? And it goes back to specially designed instruction, really focusing on what that student needs in order to, um, to close that achievement gap. Figure 10 um, will show you a comparison of um, the NES and NESA. I also want you to bring, bring attention um, to the number because there are less students in, uh, with disabilities in the NES and NESA um, schools. And so as you look at that data, that's something um, I wanted to bring attention to. Um, the last page is really our action steps, and I kind of already talked through this as I was going through the presentation. Um, but again, that strong focus on specially designed instruction and what does that mean for our students with disabilities here in Houston ISD. And again, our overall district focus on uh, providing support in collaboration across um, our, div our divisions as well as academics to ensure that all our students have what they need as we move forward. And then that's just a glossary for terms. Are there any questions on um, 4.3, progress measure 4.3? Questions, comments, discussion? Ms. Linder, please, thank you. Thank you. Thank you, th thank you for the for the information. Really appreciate it. The clarification I'd appreciate is on the action steps providing targeted professional development interventions. Um, I heard you say you know training has been um, a key um, I guess factor or action taken there. Would you explain what compliance looks like for that? How do we know that the training is actually resulting in the um, specially designed instruction, you know, output. So twofold. I, um, that is an area that we looked at in the folder review summary to look at IEPs because specially designed instruction should be outlined in the student's IEP and their IEP should be based on the data for that student and that student's specific needs. So that's one area that we looked at when we did the folder reviews. Um, again, that really informed our training, but the other thing that we're seeing and is that um, the ability to distinguish between what is tier one instruction and maybe accommodating for all students because all students can be accommodated for versus specially designed instruction and so training not only our special education teachers, but our general education teachers on that and how to really write solid IEP plans and imp with implementation. And as we're training that right now, we're working with our principals as they're conducting their observations. What does that look like in a classroom? Um, and what would that look because it looks specially designed instruction happens in a general ed classroom for a student with a disability and or a special education classroom um, with a student for disability so that's really um, our focus as we move forward and um, really focus instructionally on what students need in the implementation of that IEP. Any other questions, comments, concerns? Mr. Vaughn, yes, sir. So, um, figure eight, really, <clears throat> it, you know, it's been pulling on my heartstrings for a while, but I'm, I'm wondering whether and what um, analysis have been done about these particular students. I mean, I, I have a hard time with any gap, but this one just, for some reason, I'm confused or not confused, but really it just pulls on my heartstrings. So I'm thinking about like, have we looked at like where the students are receiving home instruction, like geospatially, where in the district, the gaps, like uh, are the goals being set in a smart fashion? And like, I, I don't understand how these students with specially designed IEP have this sort of performance gap because it seems like 
they would be receiving some sort of additional equality, if you will, because they've got already so many eyes on their work? So I'll um, kind of just talk about a student who was served under special education services who requires special education services is identified through a two-prong approach. Number one is the student has to have a disability, such as a learning disability, um, other health impairment, et cetera. But they also have to have an educational need. And so when you look um, at the educational need, um, and going back to my first reference of the data that we're looking at today is meets grade level proficiency. So these students are already showing an educational need that they're not at grade level proficiency and that is why they need the specially designed instruction to close that achievement gap. Now, people, um, where we're at right now, we know we have work to do around that specially designed instruction to get that gap to close. And I hear that, but at the same time, I, I struggle with the fact that there's 600 white and Asian students in this chart. There's 6,000 students that are not white and Asian. So 90% so of the students can't possibly have a higher level disability that prevents them from learning uh, to whereby they're achieving it at 10% and below and these others are achieving at 40 to 45 percent. You see where I'm going? Like, I, I, I'm having a hard time connecting with such a great disparity. And, and I, you may not have an answer for this now, but I just really want you to begin to noodle on that more. I think because it's it's there's something there that that is is greater than just. Um, the students, I, I guess, is where I'm going. I also think next week when we talk about our next week, it won't be next week, it'll be next month, right? Um, when we to look at our growth progress measure, on to, when we look at the progress measure that talks about growth, that's where we see the most progress with our students with disabilities, knowing that there's that educational need um, that qualifies them for special education services, then we're, can t we're not saying that they can't meet it because disabilities vary, right? And student needs vary, and we're always going to aim for meets grade level criteria. But there's also a reason why a student qualifies for special education services, which is a disability and that educational need. And our job as educators is really to design that IEP to address the edu educational needs so that they can access the curriculum to the best of their ability. Some students may not meet proficiency um, based on those factors, um, based on that student. But we're going to continue to work with them, and I think, um, like I said, next month when you see the growth measures, um, maybe that'll um, that'll help some. Okay. I, I think it will, but at the end of the day, I think we also just really need to be thinking, like, intentionally focused on, like, how we improve the outcomes for the 90%. Um, yes, I want to see growth, and I, and, and I think that's critical, but what we're missing here is, is achievement in 90% of our students with disabilities, um, where they're so far below where um, the 10% are. And, that, and that's all my only point, so I'll leave it there. All right. Any other comments or questions? Okay, um, is there a motion to accept the board monitoring update for presentation of goal three, progress measure 3.1, and goal four, progress measure 4.3? I think you have to hit my computer in order to make a motion or to vote. Thank you, thank you very much.
Okay, we have a motion by Ms. Lindner and a second by Ms. Flowers. Um, please vote. Adam, are you a yes on accepting the report? Abstain. I'm sorry? Abstain. You abstain from accepting the report? Okay. Okay, we have eight in favor of accepting the report, one abstention. We will now hear from speakers who registered for hearing of the community in the order in which they signed in this evening. Again, speakers are limited to one minute each per board policy. A reminder, please stay on topic and refrain from naming individuals, especially students, as their identity is protected under the law, but you may name your own child. I ask that you please respect our procedures and the other speakers and end your comments promptly when your time has expired and the timer rings. We'll call speakers to the microphone in groups, beginning with speakers number one through 10. We have seats in the front row here reserved for um, the, the first and then consecutive um, groups of speakers. So if you don't mind coming forward, we'll start with speaker one and we will go that way. Hello. Hi, okay. Madam President, go ahead, board. Please. Thank you for your service. I'm a banker helping business owners raise money to grow their companies. My husband works in energy and we have two daughters in HISD. The district's hard pivot to a one size fits all business model has undermined high quality instruction and love of learning. No business owner with hundreds of successful stores would change every store to address unique problems at a few. In less than a year under chaotic leadership, the district has become a toxic place to work. We are losing our best employees. Following the takeover, I watched and waited, knowing that without more money, systemic improvement is impossible. No money is coming, so I'm here not hopeful for the upside of a takeover, but in fear of the downside. You all have impressive bios, leaders with strong ties to our community. I ask, what will your legacy be? Thank you. Our next speaker is Derek Stinson. Yes, sir. My name is Derek Stinson. I represent Kickstart Kids. Thank you guys for allowing us to be here. The students who are in the karate program, in the karate uniforms earlier are part of our program. Kickstart Kids have served HISD for 32 years. And we've done so by being innovative in, in our approach to character education. Our whole curriculum is in, it involves discipline, respect, self-control, the things that the young kids spoke about today. But we also talk about responsibility, about kindness, about respect. respect. And we do that through the, through the instructor that's in the classroom throughout the entire day. And I'm sure, I know we're not even on discussion as far as Kickstart Kids. We are serving right now on non-NES, but we want to be in the NES. We want to make impacts where character education is also needed, not just the affluent schools, but the schools who need some impact. So we want to work. And um, I'm, I'm going to be here every time. Thank you. Thank you. OK, our next speaker is Chris, Christy Brewster. Yes, ma'am. Board of Managers, now, from now on, known as the Nine to Nothing Crew. Do you hate school-aged children and school personnel so bad that you will vote yes for 99.9% .9 of all the agenda items that this little man brings to you? Or are you just contributing to the setup for the mess up of HISD? Yes, you're voting yes to, you know, closing the libraries, firing the librarians, the wide open, nose opening budget and fund access that you give this uncertified wannabe leader. And then you remove the campus based services, direct services for the students that you know your wraparound services were providing. You moved it to the boondocks where they can't even get to it. And it's called the Sunrise Center. Now, do you really hate school aged children and school personnel that bad? Or do you just hate school aged children and school personnel in certain zip codes? Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Our next speaker is Brianna Borson. Ms. Borson, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Brianna. I am 
I'm a mom of two HIC students and a member of our PTO board and SDMC. I'm here to talk tonight to highlight the reality of our non-English speaking students. There's lack of native language support on our campuses and a greater need to understand the socioeconomic factors these students face. They do not fit into the cookie cutter NES system being forced on them. We need to meet them where they are and provide support that will actually make a difference. This lack of understanding sets up students, teachers, and schools to fail on standardized tests by which they are measured. I'm speaking tonight on behalf of teachers who fear retaliation. This fear is bred and disseminated directly from the top. It remains to be seen whether this is your intent or simply a byproduct of poor leadership. Either way, our children and educators deserve better. Thank you. Our next speaker is Robert Borsum. Yes, sir. Good evening. My name is Robert Van Borsum, and I'm the father of two HISD students. However, I'll be using my time to speak on behalf of a concerned faculty member who fears retaliation. Houston is world-renowned as the city for space exploration and education, and yet the recent eclipse has demonstrated another missed opportunity to engage our students in a meaningful learning experience. HISD failed to provide adequate resources and coordination for the eclipse event. Training and supplies were haphazardly handled, and on the day of the eclipse, some schools were barred from going outside to witness the event firsthand. This inconsistency highlights a glaring disparity in expectations and a lack of com communication within the district. Furthermore, the absence of any mention of the Eclipse and Daily Curriculum slides reveals a disconnect between classroom learning and real-world events. Educators who recognize the educational value of the Eclipse took proactive steps to ensure their students had a meaningful experience. However, the disparity in expectations and communication suggests a systemic issue within HISD, where teachers are set up to fail rather than succeed. As stewards of education, it is imperative that we address these disparities. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker is John Cole. Ms. Cole? My name is Katherine Donis. I am speaking for a SPED teacher at a non-NES school in fear of retaliation. One of the reasons for the TEA takeover of HISD was special education. However, special education students in self-contained classrooms in HISD are not getting the education they need because Mr. Miles decided to cut special education teachers and teaching assistants so he could bring more of his friends from Colorado into HISD to make six-figure salaries and so he can get kickbacks from our governor and his friends. Students are shoved into self-contained class where there is room regardless of their individual education needs without additional support. SPED staff has, is so busy trying to prevent the students' art for their classroom from getting hurt from students that are randomly placed there because their behavior does not fit into the cult of NES. Students are not getting the appropriate accommodations and education documented in their paperwork. Mr. Mouse, stop making HISD your psychological experiment. Our next, thank you, ma'am. Ma'am. Ma'am, your time is up. Ma'am, your time is up. Ma'am, your time is up. Don Cole. Our next speaker is Don Cole. Uh, speaker number seven, Ms. Cole. Is that you? Um, six. Oh, Christine Anderson. Six. Yes, ma'am. Go okay. ahead. Christine Anderson. I learned in real estate school that the primary drivers of property value are proximity to employment and good schools. In most real estate listings, you see a line that says zone to coveted elementary school. With the current superintendent and board of managers attacking the public school system, this is the type of listing you can expect to see. Zone to embattled schools without libraries staffed with uncertified, inexperienced teachers and uncertified superintendent. We know because of the bad faith management of our schools by Miles and the board of managers, teacher turnover is twice what it was the prior year. Excellent qualified and certified teachers are fleeing to the suburbs. Parents are making hard decisions to take their children out of HISD schools. We therefore have declining enrollment. Flight to the suburbs will follow. Our property values, our most valuable asset, will decline as well. I'm pointing this out to the people who think there are no consequences of the board takeover in their lives because they don't have kids in public schools. Make no mistake, property values will decline. Our next speaker, I believe, is Ms. Cole. Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. Hi, I'm Dawn Cole. I have two students in HISD. Educational leaders build dynamic systems that empower. They know schools should be showered with resources, 
to help all students develop their authentic potential. Atrophy is anathema to their mindset. But we all know this is not about education. If it were, you would not decimate libraries and mandate rote scripted lessons. Let's compare it with Kincaid, an elite private school where one of the board of managers teaches. My kids were once in an elite private school, but we left and have been very happy in HISD until now. Her current employer failed to make this on her HISD bio. Kincaid has some really nice libraries. This week's Chronicle article on Kincaid's expansion reads, alumni, students, teachers surveyed that felt the classrooms were built for, for, were built were for outdated, an outdated educational model. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, thank you. Ma'am, ma'am, this is your first warning. Ma'am, I'm sorry, but I have to give you a second warning. Ma'am, if I have to give you another warning, thank you, thank you. Our next speaker, our next speaker is Yale Costilla. Ms. Costilla. Ms. Costilla. My name is Jasmine Colvin with Good Reason Houston. With federal pandemic relief funds coming to an end, the Texas legislature not increasing public school funding last year, and decrease in student enrollment that HISD has been experiencing over the past several years, HISD, like districts across the state, will be forced to make tough choices about how to prioritize funds, i.e. budget cuts. Throughout this perfect storm, I urge HISD to keep equity, equity at the top of mind. Careful consideration must be made because budget cuts can have long-lasting effects on students and widen achievement gaps for low-income students of color by impacting specialized programming, classroom sizes, instructional materials, and school safety. In the past, elected officials have publicly called out their struggles to direct needed financial resources to their underserved communities most struggling to succeed academically. Therefore, we support this board directing more funds to students and campuses that need the most support. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yale Costilla. Our next speaker. Like sir, please go ahead. Please go ahead. This is a board meeting. Let's go ahead, right. sir. Um, ladies and gentlemen, we are in a board meeting. We are at 10.28 p.m. and we have a person here who's ready to speak. Let's be mindful and respectful for our folks who are in the room who are ready. It's sir, He's please go ahead. Out. He's on our payroll. Go ahead, sir. We pay sir. him. He doesn't need to be here. Go ahead, sir. We didn't sir. want him to begin with. He should not be paid. Exactly. We didn't want him to begin with. Look, sir, your time has begun. Please go ahead. I need no introduction, for I am not special. I am, however, disappointed. Disappointed that we as a people have let this infection take over HISD. Have we forgotten who we are? Are we not AF Harris County? Are we not Houston? Yeah. yeah. We may not be old enough to remember, but allow me to educate these puppets. Every school district owes its existence to their counties and don't think HISD is any different. In 1920, we taught the state what happens when you mess with Houston. We wielded our democratic power. This county possesses the education code. And with it, we took the district back from the state. Now I wield that same county code, chapter 13, the creation of school districts. HISD cannot be saved. This infection cannot be cured. But we will burn the school district to the ground and from its ashes build new school districts. This chapter was designed specifically to separate ourselves from schools and our, Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Our next speaker, can you, our next speaker, I believe is Catherine Danis, number 10, um, number 11. Okay, Mr. Zachary Ruiz. Thank you. Jessica Dugan, Ms. Dugan. And if the folks who are numbers 13 through 23 or so can swap um, and come up to the front, that would be great. Thank you. Um, Ms. Dugan is number 12. Go ahead, ma'am. Thank you. 
Glad you're back. I'm Jesse Dugan, and I'm, mom, uh, I'm a mom to twin four-year-olds. I'd like to talk about two of the board members I would never vote for if I still had my right to vote, but no, that right has been stripped away from me and all of us. Starting with the uncertified Superintendent Mike Miles, grifter. This grifter has no experience as a teacher or educator, and not a single school district where he served as superintendent is better off than how he found it. And now he founded a charter school consulting company so he can start profiting off of both ends of this thing. First by tanking our public schools and then swooping in with his charter schools to pick up the pieces. And then we've got HISD Vice President Rick Campo, the oligarch. I'm getting pretty tired of you multimillionaires telling me there's no money for libraries and other services for our kids. Especially when your company, Camden Apartments, is making billions. <laughs> Building cheap mid-rises and keeping my generation renting forever. All that money and power, you still can't fire this grifter. And when parents confront you about your intentions here on the Thank you, ma'am. Thank parents, you. Ma'am, thank you. Ma'am, thank you. Kyle, Kyle Dugan, our next speaker is Kyle Dugan. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. My name is Kyle Dugan, and I'm a father of twin four-year-olds in this district. We all deserve a superintendent who does not have a continuing financial interest diametrically opposed to the educational interest of the children in Harris County. This board, unelected and not representative of the will of the people, has hand-waved away Mike Miles' clear conflict of interest in an addendum to his contract. And you only do that because you know it is a conflict. Otherwise, you wouldn't have done it and you wouldn't have thought it necessary. None of us here had any say in that betrayal of our children for the benefit of Mr. Miles' bank account. Your signature is on that document, ma'am, and I hope you think of that with every horror story that emerges from here. It is fundamentally unacceptable that this board is complicit in Mr. Miles' continued involvement with Third Future Schools while superintendent of Houston Independent School District. When he's done tearing down the school districts here in this county, he will invariably resign as superintendent, return to third future schools, and then be free to reap the ill-gotten charter school gains of the systemic dismantling of our educational institution here. Our next speaker is Aaron Piper. Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. My name is Erin Piper and I'm speaking on behalf of an HISD teacher that fears retaliation. As a bilingual teacher of the year with 20 years, over 20 years experience, I'm extremely troubled by the disparities and assessment practices for bilingual students in HISD. While I teach all subjects in Spanish, my students are also evaluated in English language arts using DBLS, a practice that fails to account for their limited English proficiency, unique linguistic needs, and adds additional burden on bilingual students who must test more frequently than their peers. DBL scores are also being used to evaluate teachers, which is extremely problematic, especially in classrooms with high numbers of newcomer students who do not show growth within an arbitrary amount of time. This places bilingual teachers at a disadvantage, especially if their campus is transitioning to NES next year and they are required to pass proficiency screeners to stay based on these unfair metrics. Our students deserve fair and comprehensive evaluation methods that support their language acquisition and academic growth. It is imperative that the board addresses these discrepancies and advocates for equitable assessment practices for bilingual students. Thank you. Our next speaker is Olivia Lowe. Ms. Lowe? Olivia Lowe? No? She may have left. Okay. And Nihal Shaheen? Yes, ma'am. Are we on 15? Number 16. Number 16. Go ahead, ma'am. Oh, okay. Okay, Ms. Shaheen, please come on up and we'll figure out who's next. I'm Nihad Shaheen, a parent and a teacher and an, was an SDMC member and a community member at HISD. I made this so that you know uh, which entity is talking because I don't want the parent, uh, the, my parents' right to be taken away from me. Mr. Miles, the previous meeting after I introduced myself, I invited you to meet with me to elaborate further on what I couldn't really, on what I have been facing and I couldn't uh, elaborate publicly to avoid retaliation. However, it was not a surprise at all that you never did as this was the same disregard I received from all district employees I reached out to. I did receive a certified mail signed by your name though. I had to change the rest of my speech after the board's recognition of the Arab American uh, Heritage Month, although today is the 11th, but I think with the 3% um, Arab population in Houston, I think as a minority we should be grateful for the um, being recognized on the 11th. 
Um, with the fear of retaliation that everyone is speaking about, I think this is a hostile working. Thank you. Our next speaker, Davi Garza. Did you figure out your number? Okay. Uh, Davi Garza. It's, yes, ma'am. Please come on up. Hello, I'm Davy Garza, HISD parent, PTA member, and community leader. I am speaking on behalf of a non-NES teacher who wishes to remain anonymous due to fears of retaliation. Jessica Naiman claims that teachers are getting a pay boost, but the truth is the opposite. Let's consider a non-NES teacher with 10 years of experience. Currently, the teachers work 187 days, earning $67,500. With Neiman's plan, they would make $69,000 next year. However, considering the new calendar, teachers will work 197 days, 10 more days. Looking at this year's salary table, all things being equal, considering the 10 additional working days, a teacher with 10 years of experience should earn $71,110, but HISD is offering $69,000. Where is the pay increase? Now, these are my words. Thanks to my wonderful public school teachers, the math is easy. Why is HISD introducing pay cuts during a critical moment of teacher retention? Board, man board of managers, please hold Superintendent Miles accountable to a real pay increase for teachers. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Christy Puthers? Ms. Puthers? Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Christy Puthers. I'm a second generation HISD graduate and will be the parent of two HISD graduates. Now, when y'all took over, I trusted that your, your word, that you would lift up and support struggling schools, but you've broken that trust. Instead, you rolled out a one-size-fits-all approach. And the problem with that is every school is different and every school needs something different. It needs something unique. Our education, our educators aren't being trusted to make the decisions for what's best in their own classrooms or on their own campuses. And if they deviate from the prescribed mandates, their jobs are on the line. It's created a toxic environment of fear and mistrust, and it's suffocating our best ed educators. And from what you've heard tonight, driving them away. There is not a one fits, uh, there's not a one size fits all solution here, not for schools, not for classes, not for students. And our teachers, they're the experts. So why aren't we trusting them? They've been to school. They know what's in their rooms. And they know how to Thank you. Our next speaker is Magna Goswami. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Meghna Goswami, and I'm a mother of two children at two excellent HISD schools, T.H. Rogers and Carnegie Vanguard High School. Thank you for listening to the voices of students and parents at the Barch Board meeting and ensuring that the flawed principal assessment system will not be used for evaluating principals this year. I implore you to make sure the tool is scrutinized for validity before being implemented next year. Today, I want to share my concern about the teacher evaluation system, a system that is rigid and prescriptive and is not nuanced enough to evaluate teaching of advanced classes, such as the, those taught at schools my kids go to. The matrix also does not lend itself to evaluate instruction of the arts or theater, among others. All of us want to ensure that all students within HISD succeed. I hope the Board of Managers will work to ensure that all tools that are being used by HISD are valid and effective. Thank you. Thank you. Rourke Lynch. Yes, sir. Hello. I'm Rourke Lynch. I'm the father of a five-year-old who is entering HISD schools this fall. I'm a son and a nephew and a brother-in-law of teachers, principals, paraprofessionals here in Houston and throughout this country. Um, you, Mr. Miles. The board that enables you and those that hoisted you upon us concern me. Your choice of actions and their disassociation from the lifting of the lives of our children concerns me. Your lack of accountability concerns me. When I watch you, I get the distinct impression that you see outrage from this community as a sign of success, and it is not. You and the board that sits with you do not well represent the will of this community. I see few signs that you represent the aspirations of public education. While our facilities decline, you drive away the experienced professionals that make our great schools great, repeal, uh, repel future educators needed to rebuild and damage our shared future. We will, we will stay here. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is Teresa Carr. And then if um, the folks who are 23 to 33 or so can move, up, move forward, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'm Teresa or Reese Carr. I am speaking on behalf of a teacher too afraid to speak for, out of fear of retaliation. My students are scared of their administrators. I am scared of my administrators. They have made it clear that they don't care about the students. They don't care about our well-being. They only care about the appearance of performance. I can tell my administrators are scared of you. The students sense that fear. They are scared to learn here. More scared their teachers will be removed and they will have substitutes for the rest of the year. And their futures will be stolen and they can do nothing about it. And then these are my words. Aren't you guys tired? Like, not because it's... 1030 at night, but because aren't you're hearing story after story of people in your community telling you this is horrible and it's not working. And you guys might occasionally say no, but it's not often enough that these are actually ending. When do y'all make these end? Thank you. Our next speaker is Joan Newhouse. Joan Newhouse. Oh, yes, ma'am. Joan? 22. 22? Oh, there is no 22 on my list. Please go ahead. Yes, yes ma'am. <laughs> right here. <laughs> Great. Come on up. Um, my name is Gauri Samlani, and I'm a parent to two uh, Carnegie Vanguard High School students, and I stand before you today as a concerned and increasingly frustrated parent. The recent implementation of the new teacher evaluation system has been nothing short of a catastrophe. And the repercussions are already proving to be irreversible. This unproven evaluation system has been rolled out with such haste that it has left chaos and confusion in its wake. Teachers are being judged by metrics that have not been properly vetted or proven to accurately reflect their effectiveness across AP, IB, or any other common types of classroom formats. As a result, we are witnessing a mass suppression of experienced educators who feel demoralized, undervalued, and unfairly targeted. How can we expect our students to thrive when their teachers are constantly living in fear of losing their jobs? How is that possible? Every teacher lost Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. <laughs> Ms. Newhouse? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. My name is Joan Newhouse. I'm the executive director of Kickstart Kids, and I'm here because I couldn't quite finish my comments last month. Um, school administrators regularly tell us the program that we offer reduces bullying and discipline problems, improves academic performance, attitude, mental health, attendance, and the sense of community on campus. Kickstart Kids believes we can help HISD achieve many of its goals. We currently offer our program on 10 middle school campuses, and we would enjoy the opportunity to expand to additional campuses, including the NES schools, which we are not clearly able to serve because of the way the purchasing guidelines are set. We don't think that the, the, the administrators don't quite understand where we fit. <clears throat> the students thrive in our program. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I think that we heard from these two, their students, Alejandra and Enrique Uribe, earlier tonight, uh, unless they're adults who are here right now. No. Okay. Uh, Lauren Simmons, I think number 26. Yes, ma'am. What's up, best friend? It's been a while. <laughs> Last time we talked, you know, we kind of broke the internet a little bit, me and Ms. Hensley over there, but actually I'm here on behalf of, hey, um, Michelle, Jeanette, Angela, I'm going to need y'all attention. Thanks, Paula, for paying attention. Um, here I'm speaking on behalf of a teacher who, Jeanette, Jeanette, come on. It's, it's 1045, come on. Speaking on behalf of a teacher who's afraid of retaliation, I didn't need a prediction ring to tell me what I already knew was gonna happen to this district, but I will say this. 
This year, HISD eliminated the autism support team, a vital team with knowledge and expertise in supporting students with autism. Now there's only one board certified behavior analyst who is assigned to multiple schools. As a special education teacher in a program serving children with autism, I would normally have at most eight students. Today I have 16. My colleagues have had as many as 22 students with autism. Because of this overcrowding, students are not receiving the quality of service needed to be successful, and that is illegal and it's wrong. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am, thank you. Cheryl Hensley. Cheryl, Cheryl Hensley, number 28, Cheryl Hensley, Miss Hensley. Good evening. Yes, ma'am. Cheryl Hensley, librarian, usual suspect. As required by House Bill 900, mandatory collection development standards have been adopted and are now part of the Texas Act Administration Code. In order for our district to be in compliance with these standards, I quote, that school districts must ensure a professional certified librarian trade on proper collection development standards and is responsible for the selection and acquisition of library materials. No other person on campus is more qualified than the school librarian. By dismantling library service department, you are losing five qualified librarians to do this job and hiring two positions who are not required to have a library certification, the task of compliance is impossible for over 200 schools. Dallas currently is in posting 100 positions for librarians, Dallas ISD. Dallas has made a commitment to put a library back in every school. Well, then, let's put Thank, back you, library. Let's every school. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Our next speaker is Thomas Grosskirk. Yes, sir. It's number 27. Uh, good evening, members of the board. If TEA's takeover was to ensure HISD followed Texas standards, why has Mr. Miles requested an exemption to implement his own evaluation system? The method to drive success in schools is not to purchase a plethora of packets from, that will line the pockets of consultants at the cost of reading specialists and librarians' jobs, but rather it's to invest in teachers, interventionists, and making schools stable, such as universal kindergarten not hounding teachers with evaluations that force them onto a bell curve of checked boxes and displays. Mr. Miles says we should look to technology as the cure for school issues. The cruel irony is he's adopted a evaluation system that Microsoft used in the 90s, that it was the chief culprit of that company's stagnation and is widely known in the tech industry as a failure. Regardless of how this takeover occurred, you are now the members with the authority and responsibility of our community to drive accountability within HISD. We are counting on you. The bond will fail without changes. Thank you. Thank you. I think we're on speaker 29, Mr. Grosskirth. Yes, sir. I'm speaking on behalf of a teacher who cannot speak tonight for fear of retaliation. It is Autism Acceptance Month, and I want you to know that I have chosen to resign because as a person with autism, I find the treatment of students with exceptionalities under the new HISD administration to be heartbreaking. Living in an holistic world as a person with autism can be especially traumatic because the world is not built for us. Undiagnosed or undertreated autism in children can result in disorders such as complex PTSD, depression, chronic anxiety, suicide ideation, the list goes on. It is important that you, the board, are aware of the risk you take with our children when you cut funding for our specialists. Our counselors are overwhelmed and under-equipped to identify autism or address the unique sets of needs for children with autism. I no longer trust the district to support the needs of students or employees like me. No trust, no bond. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Kathy Beasley. Kathy Beasley. Ms. Beasley, number 30. Michelle Colbert. Ms. Colbert? No? Uh, Jennifer Higgins, 32. And if the next 10 folks or so don't mind coming forward, that'd be great. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, yes, Jennifer Higgins. To you, I'm a new face. But most importantly, I'm a parent of HIC with three children. While well, recognizing the initial need for improvement in our district, it is now apparent that Mr. Miles' ways are not the right way. Our top performing teachers are at a breaking point. 
they are leaving us. They are highly skilled professionals who are being treated like children. They are exhausted and feeling undervalued. Instead of being trusted to do their job, they are subjected to constant surveillance and unclear expectations. They are restricted to their methods of teaching and given <coughs> curriculum that doesn't suit their students' needs. They are burdened with excessive paperwork and assessments and are treated like they can't be independent. Their evaluations are based on compliance and not on their true expertise. This culture of fear created by this administration is pushing them away as evidenced by the alarming number of vacancies in our schools. Just take a look at our career page. Our Thank you, ma'am. Our next speaker, our next speaker, our next speaker is uh, Anna Lusuriaga. I'm, I'm a parent to a SPED and a GT student. I'm here on their behalf and for the teachers, the administrators, principals that are unable to voice about this new HISD climate of fear, disrespect, and one size fits all that Mike Miles has created. I know so many families that have already bailed this sinking ship. Just this week, a veteran SPED chair told me that they're interviewing outside the district due to this HISD hostile environment, not allowing her to focus on the students' needs. HISD, as discussed earlier, this new SPED action plan is focused on monitoring tests such as the map to determine the progress. My son this year was given the map. He was not allowed to use any of his legal accommodations for this testing. How can these changes positively impact our students and teachers? I am imploring this board to question Mike Miles and his methods of assessment to reject Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, ma'am. Our next speaker is Molly, Molly Cook. Ms. Cook here. Our next speaker is Alara Raman. Ms. Raman, is she here? No. Christina Wilkerson? No. Melanie Gaiman? Catherine Buchanan? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. I'm a parent of a child at a high-performing magnet high school of gifted and talented students. Our teachers of honors, pre-AP, and AP classes are being penalized using the inherently problematic teacher evaluation system that you created, that even your TEA called odd. If instead of using MRS, DOLs, and timers, teachers use best practices required for teaching advanced and college level classes with lecturing, discussions, and sustained reading and writing, they're failing your evaluations. Our students routinely achieve master's level on STAR assessments and score fours and fives on College Board AP tests, which are testaments to the high quality, best practices teaching that our students receive. It's past time to stop penalizing highly effective teachers and harming students. You must adopt a valid third party review. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Catalano, Andrea Catalano, is she here? No. Lindsay Davey? Matthew Garza? Yes, sir. Good evening. Um, I am a Kids Our Kids instructor. I'm actually the instructor of the kiddos that were up here earlier speaking. Um, I started the program in 2003. Um, I am an alumni of the program, as well as the school that I teach at, which is Frank Black Middle School. Um, 20 plus years later, I get to instill these principles and philosophies into these kiddos. Um, kiss our kids, we save lives. We try to put our best foot forward every single day. I'm there 12 hours a day, sometimes six days a week. Um, and I consider it an honor and a privilege to be able to do this for these kids because I know how much it helped me when I was a child. Uh, with your continued support, I hope to continue to do that. Us. Thank you. Samuel Salazar, Samuel Salazar. No? I think Sean Afghani was one of your students earlier. Cassandra Hamilton, is Miss Hamilton here? Yes, ma'am. I'm a little nervous. 
And then if the folks who are um, number 45 through 60 could come up towards the front, that'd be great. Yes, ma'am, please go ahead. I wish I could speak highly of the school my grandson attended. And I want to thank you, Ms. Audrey, for emailing me back. The second week of school, my grandson, I was approached by the teacher that the assistant principal and her decided to take notes about my grandson. I immediately placed him in Kumon and at Texas Southern at four years old for tutoring. The teacher does not communicate with me anymore. I was told Mr. Miles would not meet with me. I have emails for backup on how they are placing children there in special ed. They tell you about what you can receive. I refuse to receive any monetary for my grandson because I have a son back there who was placed in special ed, graduated National Honor Society, and is at Texas Southern University and will be leaving for the reserve. So I know what prayer can do. I need help. I need to meet with you all to so please read my emails. Thank you. Um, our next speaker is Tak Shun. Yes, good evening, uh, HISC board. I would like to bring to your attention on some of the so-called temporary buildings at Myerlin Middle School. These buildings are not temporary at all because some of them are 30 to 35 years old. The condition of these T buildings are in really bad condition. First of all, they are wood-based containers that are sitting out in the open field for the past 30, 35 years. If you look at some of the pictures that I've submitted, there are holes on the exterior walls. The woods are warped and potentially rotten. Uh, pools of water surrounding the T buildings, visible water damage, potential water stain on inside ceilings. With the Houston humidity, I can only guess there could be hidden mold growth in some of these T buildings. During my child's current eighth grade year, her eczema flares up way more and she has developed a se severe uh, frequent headaches. Uh, only started this year when she walked into some of these T buildings. Uh, she has also recently missed some of her homework deadline because she ended up crashing and falling asleep after she comes home from school. Her body got exhausted. Thank you, ma'am. Just wanted to guys to come out and Thank you. Our, our next speaker is George, George Stansel. I think we Anna Nikolai. Nikolai? Yes, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, my child goes to a high school where most of the classes are AP and pre-AP classes that are taught according to the College Board of Education curricula. It is my understanding that under the new mandate, um, AP and pre-AP teachers across Houston ISD need to teach using the cycle lesson and are evaluated with a spot form that really don't allow for practices such as extended writing and extended discussions, which in the College Board curricula are deemed as absolutely necessary to de develop critical thinking skills. If teachers are penalized for implementing these strategies, please help me understand. Is it that all of a sudden you have discovered that the College Board curricula are poorly designed? Is it that actually the new teacher evaluation system is not valid, that doesn't have content validity? It really doesn't evaluate what it's supposed to evaluate. Or is it that you are intentionally discouraging practices that will allow our students to become better critical thinkers? Please, please stop failing our students and teachers. Thank you. Our next speaker, Jennifer Perry. Yes, Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, board. My name is Jennifer Perry. I have four children in HISD in three different schools, and they're all Title I. Um, I came out tonight to thank the board of managers that came to our community event this weekend um, at one of our schools. It really meant a lot for us to, for you to be there, to see our community. Uh, one of our tenants is grace and courtesy that our community is built on. I hope you felt that. I hope you saw that in our kids and in our teachers and our administrators. Um, the, I wish grace and courtesy could be felt throughout HISD and uh, in the way in which we treat our principals and our teachers. It's something that's sorely lacking. The way in which we have attempted to address our principals in the evaluations um, plan um, it treats them like they're not professionals. We would never want to be treated like that in our own in our own um, professions. And I'm glad that we stepped back and that y'all asked some hard questions of um, Superintendent Miles. We have to do that every time. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you. Our next speaker is Becky Seabrook. Ms. Seabrook. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Good evening. My name is Becky Seabrook, and tonight I'm here as an owner. Um, 100 districts are currently suing the state over the legality of the 2023 TEA accountability ratings. But the board has allowed the HISD administration to use these contested ratings to increase the number of NES schools from 28 to 130. Half of the district is subject to a charter that none of us signed up for. And all of the schools are feeling a lot of negative impacts. Because the budget hasn't yet been released, it's not clear what a quarter billion dollar deficit is going to look like. There are elements of the program that have promised better pay for teachers, more SPED support resources for underserved schools, but this implementation has created a toxic environment, high turnover, and a breakdown of trust. Given the significant impact this rush to expand NES is having on our educators, on our budget, and the trust, I ask that the board reconsider the expansion of NES based on these content. Thank you. Um, our next speaker, number 51, Bryn Cabe. I think Ella Taylor was earlier. Melissa Licklider. Yes, ma'am. Good evening. In honor of National Library Week, I'm going to read you a story. Once upon a time, there was a villain. This villain was forced upon the city of Houston. He was sent here to destroy the source of where our most vulnerable citizens our children go to discover their unique superpowers. And the only thing protecting these children from the destruction of this villain is the Board of Managers. The story is missing the ending because the story is now in your hands. What is your choice to join the dark side and deny these children our future of their individual superpowers? Or do you want to be the hero these children desperately need? Board of Managers, what is your legacy going to be? That of a hero or of a villain? Speaker is Delene Maples. No, Stacy Hunter. Mr. Hunter. Yes, sir. Hello, my name is Stacy Hunter, a proud usual suspect of these fine teachers and principals in HISD, so they won't get fired. Last month, I gave an email address, firemikemiles at yahoo.com, of which several responded. One teacher said, I'm confused. You provide us with lessons plans. You give us MRS strategies to use, but you still grade us low. Another teacher said, the NES, the appraisal system, and the lockstep lesson implementation have no backing. It's turned our schools into a place of hostility. Another teacher said, and watch this, I've been told my job is in jeopardy because I'm partially disabled and can't stand an entire hour and a half. Parents, keep your kids home from taking star testing. Desperate times calls for desperate measures. This dictator is still here. We're very desperate right now. Community, be prepared to protest all future HISD career fairs so applicants won't apply until this dictator resigns and give us our school district back. Our next speaker is Camille Bro. Camille Bro. Yes, ma'am. Hello, my name is Camille Bro. I'm the mother of children at a school that will become NES next year. My son has ADHD and had a lot of difficulty learning to read. His weekly visits to a school library are what I credit in catapulting him into being a confident and enthusiastic reader. Kids deserve a re regular access to a school library with a certified librarian and the positive peer influence in their choices and passions. Kids want to walk around with their friends who will tell them what they've read and loved and which Minecraft, Dogman, or Museum Cats book to check out. They need the freedom to explore the world in the way they want. How can I trust the leadership that is taking away the joy of reading from children when they need it most? Uh, Laura Henry. Is Ms. Henry here? Yes, ma'am. She'll be followed by Sean Leader, Maria Calzada, and uh, Karina Casada. 
I'm the mother of an a, a AP student and also a National Board Certified English teacher who works at a comprehensive high school that's 93% economically disadvantaged. And I tell you that because I want you to know I just don't care about my magnet student. I care about our kids. That's why I took the job and that's why I'm here at this time of night. Um, as a teacher, I can't tell you how stressful those IRT walks were. I felt like I was in the game of Survivor, but if I lost, my, my <coughs> principal didn't get her contract renewed, and that's a really big burden to place on a teacher. My, uh, my child is taking AP classes, and AP teachers need to be evaluated based on AP expectations, not NES expectations. I want her to participate in Socratic seminars and extended writing and anything else her experienced AP teachers say is necessary. But my students need more too. The spot form doesn't allow me to give students individual writing conferences, and they need it. I can't go over answers to tests. Fast DOLs encourage my students to skim for answers. Thank you, ma'am. Ma'am. Thank you. Our next speaker is Sean. Uh, Sean Leader. Yes, sir. The NES to prison pipeline, it refers to your policies and practices to push our school children out of classrooms and into the criminal justice system. Thanks to Mike Miles and racist, and Repu racist Republicans in Austin, a growing number of HISD students will spend 2035 in a jail cell or a grave. The pipeline to prison begins with inadequate services, overcrowded classrooms, a lack of qualified teachers, insufficient funding for counselors, special education services, and even textbooks. But you're an innovator, Mike. You burn down the libraries. There is only one other instance I've even heard of schools mutilating their libraries into detention centers, and that actually comes from you at one of your for-profit making charter schools. Now, you promptly reversed course there, so I ask you, what made you actually listen to those white uh, Coloradans and not our multicultural community? Now, your failures to meet educational needs builds disengagement and dropouts. Are you proud that you doubled the dropout rate of middle schoolers in Dallas ISD before being run out of town? Are you proud that you, in just one year, Thank you, sir, thank you, sir, thank you, your time is up, sir, thank you, your time is up. Maria, sir, thank you, Maria Calzada, is Miss Maria Calzada here? Maria Calzada? Are you Maria Calzada? Okay. Good evening, my name is Maria Calzada. I'm the PTO president at Carnegie Vanguard and a mother of two. I have um, the IRT system to speak about. The IRT system is not compatible with Carnegie's award-winning teachers who specialize in advanced placement and college level courses. The IRT model is based on constant change, tightly prescribed and scripted interactions between teachers and students, which does not accommodate the prolonged reading discussions, thinking, and problem solving that we have at Carnegie. Teachers who work with GT students are unfairly penalized and it's demoralizing for them to feel like they're suddenly doing a bad job or have to suddenly change their methods. Students, as this panel have already heard, have eloquently expressed their unhappiness with the changes. But worst of all, we risk losing our faculty to other districts or the private sector. We cannot afford to play this dangerous game because without our faculty, Carnegie is just an empty building. Thank you, ma'am. I think our last in-person speaker is uh, Ms. Karina Casada. Yes, ma'am. The topic is special education and testing. HISD is out of compliance with HB 165 passed in 2019, which states that children receiving special education services can receive endorsements and or distinguished level diplomas without having passed their EOCs if the ARD committee determines it to be appropriate. HB 165 agrees that if a child needs an individualized education program, then it makes zero sense to force satisfactory performance on a standardized test. 
There's an array of reasons why a sped child may not pass an EOC while still taking classes that would earn them endorsements. I don't know if the intimidation and fear tactics that the district and school registrar use are out of malice or if they slept through their trainings and are ignorant of this law and board policy EIF, but their ineptitude is affecting sped students across this district. They falsely insist that EOCs must be passed. We need compliance with HB 165 for you to do the work of looking at IEPs, checking the PLAFs, making sure services were rendered and appropriate. Thank you. Our Ms. Smith, Ms. Smith, if you'll identify and uh, invite our Zoom speakers. Elizabeth Shepard, please turn your camera on and you may begin. <coughs> Ma'am, please unmute and you can go ahead. Oh, she was there. Oh, there she is. Ms. Shepard, you need to unmute yourself and then you can speak. Thank you. Hi, my name is Elizabeth Shepard. I am mom to two magnet students in the district. I am also a professional job coach, which means I review and rewrite resumes and coach clients through career transitions and job searches. My local business has increased over 450% in the last six months, strictly from the teachers seeking to leave this district. The board should be aware of the impending mass loss of quality instructors and that despite what Mr. Miles says, we are in a national and regional teacher shortage. There is not an available pool of hundreds to thousands of teachers waiting eagerly to join in this toxic climate of fear, retaliation, micromanagement, and shifting evaluation targets. This administration does not seem to care about protecting this valuable resource, so I beg the board to address teacher retentions as a priority. I will close by adding that where there is no trust, there can be no bond. Thank you. Ms. Lucas Roberts, please turn your camera on. You may begin. <clears throat> Sonia Lucas Roberts, please turn your camera on. You may begin. Melissa Huckabee, please turn your camera on. You may begin. Hello. Hello. I'm speaking on behalf of a teacher at a non-NES middle school who fears retaliation. A huge problem in HISD is that both teachers and students must jump through multiple last minute hoops without any reasonable explanation behind them. So far, there isn't anything that Miles and his followers have brought that has truly benefited our school. If Miles truly worked for the betterment of our schools, then highly qualified teachers wouldn't be leaving HISD. On my campus, four teachers have left, and many more are planning to leave by the end of the school year. If things don't improve, I will resign when my commitment is up in one year. If there are people who only have praises to give, it's because they're scared to lose their job. It's with this fear that Miles has decided to leave HISD, the goal being to destroy public education. Thank you. Ms. Lucas Roberts, you may begin. Today, in honor of African American Black Women's History Month, I want to honor Patty Mae Smith. Patty Mae White, excuse me. She was a member of the Houston Independent School District in 1958, the first Black member, and she was the city's first Black elected official in the 20th century. She attended Booker T. Washington High School, Houston Colored Junior High College, and also Prairie View A&M University. What I'd like to say is, despite the many racist threats that she uh, endured, she wanted desegregation and extra, extra help for our black students. One thing I must say, I wonder what she's feeling now that seeing everything's going on in a building named after her. Misuse us, abuse us, y'all don't really care about us. 
Mike Miles on the board of managers. I want to say rest in peace, Hattie Mae White. But can she really, really rest in peace, say what's going on? In spite of, we say, I, I, we say, we say thank you, thank you. Sarah Malik, please turn your camera on. You may begin. Hi, my name is Sarah Malik. It's past 11 p.m. and I have been waiting more than six hours and would have waited a dozen more for a chance to speak on behalf of a teacher at a non-NES school who fears retaliation. This is her story. I went to work during the month of December sick with the flu to the point where I lost my voice from teaching. I was there a whole week with no voice and not one person on my admin team told me they appreciated my commitment to showing up. I was there because the teachers looked down upon for needing a day off. Now I need surgery and have to wait until summer just to start my process and appointments because absences are frowned upon and teachers continue to get terminated. HIST has many dedicated teachers who continue to sacrifice themselves to be a team player at school. Administrators forget that teachers are adults and we can walk away when you continue to use and abuse and we will. You, the board, can stop the mass resignations and sent Mike Miles packing. Thank you. Maria Webb, please turn your camera on. You may begin. Hi, first of all, I'd like to thank the board for hearing and taking action in response to the community's input and concerns last month. Today, in, national, in honor of National School Library Month, I will be speaking about the importance of libraries and certified librarians on every school campus within HISD. It has been well documented in several studies the importance of reading on overall academic achievement. In addition, librarians are also certified teachers and help foster a love for learning and guide students to support their academic goals. My five-year-old's favorite class is library and was definitely a requirement when going through the school choice process. Unfortunately, with this recent administration's dissolution of the library services department, many campuses and principals are left without direct support and expert knowledge. Many campus principals with a very limited budget to begin with are left to decide if they're able to hire certified librarians or improve their library programming. We will not stand by and watch pages from Bradbury's Fahrenheit 451 eerily come to life within our schools and for our students. The community is watching, the state is watching. Please stand on the right side of history and fund our libraries and librarians on all campuses and ensure equitable access across HISD. Allison Kirby, please turn your camera on. You may begin. Hello. A community is judged by its treatment of its most vulnerable members. In our community, that is our special education students. The TEA has extensively documented how children relying on our special education have been underserved and underfunded for at least 15 years. The TEA takeover and you, the board of managers, should make these most egregious failures your top priority. Precious resources and attention are being focused on a circus of less acute issues. I would also like to highlight another type of vulnerable child, and that is a child without books. HISD is made up of 79% economically disadvantaged students, which means the most basic equity we can provide is regular access to a library. Please robustly fund and passionately support our libraries. Our kids need libraries and libraries need librarians. Lastly, stakeholder input should not be an afterthought in the middle of the night. Thank you. That concludes our speakers. Okay. All right. Um, thank you to all of our speakers this evening. Um, we are now going to, uh, Emily, I don't know if you can get it up. Um, you're not, you know. Okay. Uh, do you want to switch to Jim? And then we'll do that. Okay, Mr. Terry, we're going to go out of order. Um, we have three finance related discussion and report items the budget to actual report, the investment report, and the purchasing services quarterly report. Um, I have not asked Mr. Terry to prepare to do a presentation, but um, if anybody has questions about those reports, please feel free to ask, unless you'd like to do an overview. Just well, just uh, qu uh, quickly, um, on the uh, financial report comparisons, uh, you uh, can see that uh, 
Um, we're uh, doing well when we look at our uh, budget uh, expenditures. That's on uh, uh, Section 4. Uh, we spent uh, 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 approximately uh, uh, less than 70 75 percent on the budget side, which is a good sign. Um, that's where we want to be. And on the investment reports, I, I would re take you to uh, one page, and that would be page four, in which we look at our average yield against our benchmarks. And you can see the federal fund rates at 5.3, Treasury bills 30, um, 30 days is uh, five. Th Five, uh, less than 5.4, and Treasury bill one year is 4.9, and the Treasury two-year note is 4.5, and we're making uh, 5.48. So we're do very doing very well on our investments given uh, uh, our benchmarks. And then the last report is on procurement, and that's a report that you uh, as board members have asked us to present to you is the list of all of those items between two hundred and fifty um, thousand dollars and a million dollars, and uh, those are the three reports that are in here. Uh, I'm available at any time to uh, go into uh, accounting detail. Any questions from my colleagues, Mr. Martinez? Yeah, I'm looking at the uh, quarterly financial report. Seeing as we've um, um, invested or spent um, 65 percent. 67, 66% of the actual um, year-to-date budget, do we anticipate using, you know, because we only have three months left, so that's 25% uh, of the remainder of the school year. Do that's we anticipate exactly using right. the remainder? Do you expect that we're actually come under uh, budget? I certainly hope, and uh, we're doing all of our best to make sure that, uh, you know, the common practice a lot of times is for you know, uh, people to hold back on the budget and then to spend a lot in the last uh, in the last quarter. But uh, we've got controls in, and we think that we'll uh, we'll do better than um, and we will save some money. How much I'm not uh, I'm not uh, going to predict right now, but I think that we'll do better than the budget. Mr. Campo. I just want to uh, congratulate you and your team on money management to beat all of the benchmarks by, you know, 15 basis points on the amount of cash that, that HISD is sitting on is really good. You got, you, you, based on other investment reports that I've seen and other groups that I'm involved in, this is the best I've seen. So congratulations on that to the team. And on, on the budget, uh, definitely uh, focus on, on making sure that we uh, don't go over, but we do save money. That's right. That's my goal. Any other questions? Mr. Ravon? No? Okay. All right. We are going to thank you very much, thank Mr. You. Terry. Go Appreciate your night. time. Thank you. Um, okay. We are going to s switch over to um, item 19, which is the review of the board's quarterly self evaluation. Um, we received a um, a, an email from our board coach, Ashley Paz, I believe it was on March 26th, with um, the evaluation form. Um, I'm going to go through it um, just so that everyone is aware and um, in agreement, and then we will um, accept the item or not accept it if that's the case. But um, I'm going to just go through it. If you want to pull it up, we don't have it on the feed, so if you have your email, and you want to open it? You're more than welcome. It is on the feed. Oh, excellent. You can hit agenda. Go to 19. Okay, that's not great. I, you you kind of you you need you need really the the uh, native version, which is the Excel that came in email. Um, media um, can show the screen here, and we've got it ready. Oh, okay, great. Thank you. It's okay. Okay. Well, maybe you can maybe you can read it on the one that's on the thing. Okay, so I'm going to start. The first item is Vision and Goals 1, Student Outcome Goals. Um, and, and just to benchmark ourselves, last, last time we did this, we were at a 31 points. And um, uh, this time, I believe the estimated score is 50. So we are making progress, but I'm going to go through each category so we can um, talk about any differences people have or concerns 
we have with it. Okay, vision and goals one, student outcome goals. Um, under the preparing to focus item, we have met those metrics um, as we have adopted goals, have a vision statement, et cetera. Um, we are approaching focus because of um, the consistency of our goals with the outline metrics here. And then um, we've identified that we have um, met focus um, because um, we agree that the student outcome goals achieve those items. Um, we have not yet mastered focus. So in, in that category, we have achieved 12 points. Um, the next category, does anybody, we can go through these individually if people wanna have comments or we can save it for the end. Okay, let's save it for the end. Okay, item number two, vision and goals, two goal progress measures. Um, again, we have achieved meets focus on this particular criteria um, and we are working towards master's focus. So we are at a 12 out of possible 15 points. The next item is vision and goals three constraints. Um, and on this metric, we are at a three, which is approaches focus. Because we haven't yet adopted board self constraints. Once we do, we will progress to the next level. Okay. Our next item is Vision and Goals 4, cons Constraint Progress Measures. Here again, um, we are at the level of meets focus and have achieved a score of 4 out of potential 5 on that particular metric. This, shows 31, but it's open this, is, this is last That's the month. That's the baseline. If you'll show the 424, see at the bottom, the tab. Click on who's, 422. Who's main? Yeah, there you go. Okay, it's awful big. Can you reduce the size? Thank you. And then you're going to have to um, expand the columns. Just highlight the whole thing. Number f so um, if we go back to get vision and goals for constraint progress mo measures right there um, we are at oh that's we're at four out of five um, on the next item which is progress and accountability uh, one to fifty percent time investment this is the metric that um, deals with our obligation to in, ensure that we're focused on student outcomes as the majority of the time that we spend in board meetings and other meetings. Um, and so um, we've done the math and we actually have achieved 50% or more of the total quarterly minutes in board authorized public meetings were invested in improving student outcomes according to the time use tracker. So that's a testament to um, some progress. That's, that's really great. So 15 points out of a total of 15 points we have um, we have mastered focus on that. So we just need to maintain that because that will continue to be checked. Um, but we are at more than 50% on that. Um, the next item is progress and accountability to evaluating student outcomes. Um, uh, we are at a zero and the reason is we have not yet performed an annual ev evaluation of superintendent. And so we can't have achieved past where we are, which is a zero. Um, we have though, performed our own self-evaluation, which is good. But once we do an evaluation of the superintendent, um, we should be able to move forward. Um, the next item is systems and processes. And we can scroll down on that one as well. Um, we are, we have, if you can see here, some categories of those even in, so, We've achieved 
many of the metrics in the, the higher categories and the meets focus and the master's focus, but we haven't completed those. So we're, I believe, at a four out of 15. But we're on, our, we're on the right path there. Um, we do need to, um, in order to move forward on that one, um, uh, complete the work of reviewing local policies, um, including the work on board work. Um, advocacy and engagement and synergy and teamwork. Um, we're still at zeros on both of those. Um, um, so those are two areas where we can continue to improve. Um, does anybody have any questions, comments, or did you come with a different number for any of these elements? So just to remind everybody, in order to achieve the band, you have to complete all of the tasks in it. So even though we may have made some progress and been able to check one of the boxes or one of the items, if we haven't completed the entirety of that band and the prior bands, then we don't get the points. So, um, okay. Anybody, questions, comments, concerns, or differences of opinion on the numbers? No? Okay. All right, then. Do we have a motion to accept this item? We have a motion by Mr. Campo and the second by Ms. Mendoza. Is there any further discussion? Okay, please vote. Mr. Ravon, are you? Uh, can you tell us your vote, please? Yes. Um, we have nine in favor, zero opposed. The motion passes. All right. All right, now we will hear reports and comments from board members. We'll start with Ms. Ozan Bandy, or if you have anything to share, otherwise we'll move down the line and no, Ms. Lindner, Ms. Flowers, and then for me, Mr. Campo, no, okay, Mr. Miles, anything from you, sir? No, ma'am. Okay, the next regular board meeting will be held on May 9th, 2024, and a budget workshop will be held on May 16th, 2024. There being no further business, this meeting is officially adjourned at 11.32 p.m.